we are live. Hey, everybody. Uh, Order 42 is here, and I am Rob, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Joe Ackman, who hey, everybody. has done all kinds of things. David Ravis is here. Hey, David. How's it going? Hi, David, whoever you may be. Uh, and my actually, my dad is here as well, so... Say hello. Oh, cool. Also, <laughs> oh, you've got to be—you've got to be a good boy. Oh, I've, well, you know, I mean, you know, to a certain extent, sure. Rob has to be a good boy. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, thank you to Jim for hosting the show as well. Uh, that's always—it's always nice thank to you, see. Um, but yeah, I mean, Joe has done—I mean, gosh, you've done—you've done films, television, stage, commercials, video games, animation, anime, rec recorded books. You. You write, you direct, you do, you've done all of these things. I, I've been lucky. I get to do a lot of fun stuff. I, I, I blundered in. I don't know how, but I'm here and it's, and it's really gratifying. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's looking through your, I mean, guys, I, I posted uh, um, in the, in the chat, I posted uh, the event that shows uh, his IMDb and his, and his website. And of course his IMDb, if you look through it, it's like, scrolling and scrolling and scroll i mean it's just like it's it's amazing so like how do you get started in a career of doing these kinds of things i mean you know it's funny i i, I always say that i blundered into my career i kind of blundered into everything uh i i went to college to study psychology i had no intention of being an actor it, was, it wasn't even on my radar i had done plays in my senior year of high school hmm. i i uh, and and i was i went to an old boys jesuit high school uh, and, and I got into plays in my senior year just as the big acting teacher quit. And, and they had a big click around him. And they had a, we had a sister girls Catholic school that would come in and do the girls parts. And, and they all went away because he wasn't there anymore. So I blundered into Leeds in the first two plays I did. Hmm. Uh, just like I did Harvey and I did a Brecht. I did a Brecht play. It was weird. Uh, and, uh, and so, but so I, I discovered I liked it, but then I went to college to major in psychology. Theater wasn't even on the program, wasn't even in my radar. Huh. Uh, and, but I chose a college. I went to Middlebury, Vermont, and it was a great college it, 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 for psychology if you liked probing rats' brains with electrodes, which was, not, yeah, I'm like an animal. I, like, I cried during Born Free. Uh, it just wasn't my thing. So I blundered around a lot. Uh, I was an a, a anthropology sociology major for a while. And then blundered into theater because I learned all the same things as psychology and I didn't have to do a thesis. Uh, <laughs> I just had to do a play uh, and uh, I discovered radio while I was there. I really liked radio. Got out of college and wanted to be in radio. Uh, but I got out of college when all the radio stations were going automated. So it was the worst time in history to go into radio. And so I bounced around, did odd jobs, traveled a bunch, and then did a play, got really good reviews for it and said, well, let's try this for a while and see what happens. No one. I, so I, when I entered, I didn't enter with the burning need to be an actor or I will die. I sort of went, ah, let's try it. Uh, and figured the best way to try it was with commercials. I lived in Connecticut. I was commuting. I was working on a loading dock at UPS to support myself uh, uh, at night from two to nine, three to nine in the morning. So I had days and evenings free except for sleep. Uh, I would sleep on the train going down to New York. I would sleep in lounges in New York. I would, and, and I pursued it that way. Uh, and commercials, because I figured this face was going to be a commercial face, character guy, not a leading guy. Uh, 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 and um, so that's where I hit first and, and it, it bore fruit. And, and, you know, and I'd always done theater. Yeah, I kept doing theater all after college for fun and then tried to pursue it and got close to a couple of things. I got I had a couple of Broadway auditions, which was uh, uh, but didn't get them. And uh, and then figured the best way to get onto Broadway was to come out here. And, uh, and get a series. I'm in LA, if you don't know, and, yeah. and get in a series, and then in the off time, uh, do Broadway. That was basically the plan. Uh, and, and when I came out here, I hated LA. I knew I hated it, so it was just sort of I sort of went in and tried it out for a couple of months to see if I can get an agent. And two days before I left, I got an agent. So I came, and I was getting leaves of absence from UPS. So I came out for. They gave me another one. I came out for four months to see if I can get a job to get jobs. And two days before I left, I got a job. <laughs> And then I went back and then I came back out and then UPS said, we're not giving you any more leaves of absence. So I said, all right, bye. And uh, moved out here uh, with the intention of going back and forth because of course the Broadway and uh, uh, ran out of money, lost my apartment back East and was trapped. So then just wow. sort of made it happen. Just, just kept working and making it happen. See, 
I guess, I guess that's one of those things where, because I always wanted to be an actor, and uh-huh. I had to, I guess, I had to be critical of myself and know that you know, like, I also didn't have a. <laughs> leading man face, you know, but I thought, you know what, I could be like a character actor or something like that. I mean, that's kind of how I looked at it. I mean, I just tried to be very, I had to be very, uh, you know, just like I had to be critical of myself to a point. So it's, it's, we're all critical of ourselves. I did. I, I'm a fat guy who couldn't get girls in high school and college. So I (laughs) start. what I did is I started judging by what other people said. Right rather than by what I said, because if I was going to say it, and now I coach, and when I coach, I tell people, actors, we are never the best judges of how we're doing, ever, ever, ever. So I tend to judge by, I tend to, and still do, judge by what other people say, not by what I say. Hmm. See, that's, I don't know, that's, I think that's kind of refreshing. David asked uh, if you ever worked at MTV. I never worked at MTV. Hmm. Uh, The the, the DJ stuff went away quickly just because, uh, because, uh, like I said, everything was going automated. The key thing was I was driving to bring an air check to my favorite radio station in Connecticut. It was this real freeform FM station. I was driving along. The news hour came. After the news hour, they became an automated country station. I went, okay, that's enough. Turned around, went home. Well, it's kind of like, you know, it's it's weird how some of those industry changes, you know, where, however, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's... Uh, you know, whether you're in the marketing side, the business side, or you're, you know, uh-huh. it's like all of those marketing changes mm-hmm. kind of lead you down a path where you go, okay, well, I have a dead end here, or I can try to diversify and do this. It's just kind of interesting to hear how you, how you kind of did that. I mean, it's diversification pretty much saved me uh, and, and has kept me going all these years because when I, all the other things, when I came out here, I came out here to do TV and film. Uh, not animation, not anime. I wasn't even thinking of voiceover. Hmm. Uh, and, 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 and you know how I got into anime? I was directing a play. And it was, and they all, and this is so many years ago, and, and they advertised it. Uh, I did an interview on cable access TV. Remember cable access TV? I do. Uh, <laughs> and an old friend of mine from Connecticut saw me on that what are the chances he happened to have moved to la recently saw me on this cable ass he's probably one of two people that watched the interview and he found a way to get in touch with me and he, we had reestablished our friendship and he had gotten into anime and he got me into it so i blundered in and uh and didn't even know what it was i mean i watched uh, uh uh i watched speed racer when i was a kid that was about it that's all i knew from anime and uh, and and the people that did anime are the people that transitioned into a lot of video game work, and so here I am. Yeah, see, that's I don't know. I just I find that it's weird. It's like um, I guess in a lot of different the different people that I've kind of spoken to on this show, and just watching uh-huh. interviews, just because I'm I'm a I'm an industry dork. I love movies and I love seeing how things are made and all that kind of stuff a lot of the things you hear this one thing and it's like, you kind of have to, you kind of have to be prepared so that when that moment happens, that, that opportunity that you can jump on it. So it's almost like, you know, it's just like, uh, there's a, there's a guy that I've had on, on this show a couple of times. Um, Zeno Zoldic, it's an honor. <laughs> That was uh, Hunter x Hunter. Ah, uh, it's, you know. yeah. See, now I have to be honest with you. With anime, it's it's one of those things where I'm I have a working knowledge of it, but I'm not like super into it. But I have watched a few of the things that you've done, and it's like, yeah. I mean, it. I think one of the the interesting things is how you your characters are. I feel like I lost my point there, <laughs> but <laughs> but let me go. Let well, me go let's back. Thank the guy who honored. Thanks the guy. Thank the guy who was honored. Thank you. Uh, oh yeah. I, I, camera camera's there thank you <laughs> but like you have like this wide range of characters you know this i call myself a utility guy yeah i mean it's i guess my question is are you directed down that point or do you have some freedom to kind of build the character yourself well when you're doing anime let, for instance you walk into anime you don't know what you're doing you haven't seen the script you haven't seen the character so you're doing it on the, for the most part on the fly. 
you're going, oh, this is what he looks like. This is what he sounds like. Go. You come up with a voice. Oh, yeah, that'll do. OK, let's go. And then we're in. Wow. So it, it, it's tended to happen very fast. And 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 I've always been a utility guy. I think uh, um, that's kind of I think being part of uh, you'll understand this being a character guy is you become a utility guy uh, mm-hmm. on some level. That's how that's what happened to me on camera. I was, uh, you know, lawyer number one. I was uh, uh, slimy insurance salesman number two. I was, you know, that, it all sort of started like that. And uh, and luckily, um, even though I may not have said I wanted to be an actor until after I got out of college, there was always a part of me that went, that would be fun to do. And and I was a TV addict, so I would watch a lot of stuff. So there's a lot of rhythms that are already twir- were already twirling around mm-hmm. in me from stuff I've seen. So so it was easy, pretty easy to recognize. Oh, it's one of these kind of guys. Okay, it would be this kind of fellow. I want to be this kind of fellow. You know, it's right. Just which way right. you go. Yeah, so it's not yeah. like it's not like you're sitting there building a backstory and a and a bunch of motivation. It's literally you don't have time. Yeah, it's just the type. You don't have time. I mean, if you're lucky and it's a sustained character, you get to work that in. You you you, you get to make that happen over time. Uh, uh, but sometimes it takes a few episodes hmm. because you don't know because you're you're faking it. Hmm. Yeah. You know? See, that's really. I mean, I I don't know. I just find that impressive. It's kind of like you're pulling out these. These it's almost like archetypes, you know what I mean? That you're pulling out. Yeah. And you're you're trying I always to tell people you should have you should have a quiver, a quiver of things that you know you right. can do that you can slot into various places. I mean, Zeno, Zeno is one of these fellows I've done many times. You know, he, you know he's uh, he, he, and you just sort of plug it in. You try to make it a little different, so they're not saying, "Oh, he's the same as such and such." But it still comes from acting first, because if it comes from just trying to do a voice, it's it's going to sound false. Uh, so sometimes the thing that gives you the difference is basically just an emotional thing that's happening to that character hmm. that helps just slightly twist the way the voice sounds. It says a uh, pink mustache looked good in bleach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I tried to grow a pink mustache somewhere around that time. It didn't work. No, no, it didn't I tried work. a beard once. You see pictures of me with a beard and you, you, you are, there you are the finest bearded human I've ever met. <clears throat> and uh, and and I tried it. I guess every time I do it, I feel like I have a weasel on my face. Yeah, and it's well, just like uh, yeah. See, I mean, like I got. I mean, I've got a pretty good goatee going, but man, There's, the beard. Got a I good can't, thing going. I can't do it. I have it. It grows in patches, so it looks like I'm I'm ill or something. You know, dude. But the goatee, you are rocking the goatee. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Or is that a Van Dyke? I, Which one is? It? It's just. It's just whatever is growing at the time. I don't. Let's not give it. Let's not give it terminology. Yeah, I don't. Right? It's just, and I don't. I, I've never been one to like, you know, like shape it and things like that. I'm just. I just let it do its thing, and you know, like for a yeah. long time, I had it where it was just this bottom part. But uh-huh. but then as I got older, and you know, I guess not With trying to impress anybody. With the finely placed silver, the finely placed silver. Oh yeah. It's almost like it's planned. Like yeah, I I yeah I did, I did it myself. We will now spend two hours talking about Rob's beard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you know, it's just, it is what it is. You I've, know, first it's... Received, I've first received attention before on your show. <laughs> now, okay, so here's, this is kind of <laughs> like, sorry, a little, little, it's not much of a segue, but one of the things that I really was interested in was <clears throat> that you do a lot of audiobooks. Yes. And so... When you get that job, is it more of like, we hired you because of your voice? Or is it, we want you to kind of do it like this? Or how, how does that work? Well, um, I, mean, I would say, I mean, I basically just get called and say, hey, we want to know if you want, we want to invite you to do this book. Do you want to do it? And I say, sure, uh, pretty much. And it, it's not that you audition for it. It's uh, uh, most of the books I've done have been nonfiction uh the vast majority and most of them have been for penguin random house uh um who and basically it started because the very first union contract made with audiobooks was made with them and i was at the meeting where they announced that and i met the 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 and i had not done an audiobook other than one for uh for Gal- galaxy press uh, a bunch of uh, uh sci-fi stuff for l ron hubbard which is a story in and of itself uh and uh but but I had not really delved into that world. But when I met the, the people there, they said we have, at the time they had open auditions. You could schedule in and you come in, you read a couple of things and, and you, they put you on file and then they hire you directly from that. So 
that's pretty much how I've gotten all of them. When we get there, I mean, I tend to find, try to find a tone myself. And I ask in the first thing, is this tone working? And me and the director will, will decide that we do that. It's, it's all kind of a lot like doing anime. You don't know when you go in, you have an idea. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and with fiction, I want to read the whole book and I want to know the whole story. Uh, and so I know any arcs that I have to take as a character in nonfiction. I don't like to read the whole book up top because I want to be surprised by the information. Cause mm. I think if you're surprised, if I'm surprised by the information a little bit, there'll be more of the wonder of telling the story in it, just that little bit. So I'll read a couple of chapters to get a sense of it. I'll read it out loud to, to get a sense of how I sound in it and go, okay, this is a good way to go. And then, and then just go to town. Hmm. That's, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that that's how all people do. I think most people are much more preparatory than I am. Well, but see, that's that's really interesting though because it's really about. I guess, I guess with fiction, I can I can totally see that, but it was like like I was trying to think of how, like how, like do you like I guess that was my question was like and you answered it was that you know you just read the book as you go or do you read it first and i guess it just depends on what it is so then you can kind of i like reading it as some of the my my two favorite books that i've done were uh, uh she has her mother's laugh which is a story of uh it was the history of, of genetics and, and dna testing and uh, and heredity hmm. and, and and it's a fascinating book oh god it's good uh and uh and and i wanted to discover as i go along because part of it is the the, the narrator the writer himself discovering stuff about his own family because he's about to have his first kid and, and so i wanted to discover i wanted to discover things as i went along and it just it was it made it so much more fun to read and, and the city game which i did last year which is about uh the uh 1949 1950 new york city state college uh basketball team hmm. city college new york city basketball team uh they're the only team basketball team that has ever won uh the uh ncaa and nit uh um championships because uh, it was the only year they did it and it was, it was a fascinating story of all these guys. Uh, the, the team was very, it was a very ethnically diverse team at a time when there were no ethnically diverse teams. So they became quite the, uh, uh, the celebrated team in New York because it was a New York home team. And then they, they won these championships. And then it was discovered that almost all of them were involved in point shaving schemes. And, and it hmm. just, and everything turned. And so to, to, to read that and watch the terms, which were like, twists and turns in a story it was like there are times where i'd be reading it and my jaw would drop at what happened was, and that's fun wow that's i mean that's really cool so i guess i was thinking about i don't know like it seems like there would be some things that would just be super dry but i guess i guess if you're if you're there doing are. if but <laughs> read those two but if i mean but at the same time if you're doing your job or i would Look, yeah. hey, I don't want I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's like it's like if you're doing your job, you are your interest is their in, is the listener's interest. Exactly. In a way. Yeah, exactly. When I when I coach people, uh, I, you know, I, I do a lot of coaching. And, and one of the things I and with commercials, especially or voiceover commercials, especially the two notes I always give are talk to somebody you really care about. And this is a common note. Everybody get to somebody you really care about that you want to reveal a secret to. And like the product as if you just used it five minutes ago or just discovered it. So it has that enthusiasm, even if you're being an authoritative figure, you know, no matter what your tone is, even if you're authoritative figure, still, if the authoritative figure has just discovered this amazing information, it's going to have a certain tone of excitement in it. Uh, that even if you're just <laughs> being cool. straight on. And I think the same thing happens with, I think the same thing happens with the drier audio books. I think if you approach it like that, that it's new information that's really interesting, uh, no matter how dry it is, it's going to be that just that much more interesting. And Lord knows I've read some of those books. Hmm. Uh, it's Weasley Games uh, in here that's that's asking a lot of these or saying a lot of these comments here. Hi, Weasley Games. Uh, was playing Johnson odd? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's funny because lots of times you you ask people about or your people ask you about anime stuff that you've done and you go. I don't remember, but yes, Johnson was hard because Johnson was essentially Groot. He only says one thing, mm. and, and everything has to be filtered with how he says that one thing. So, so fun and challenging and tricky. <laughs> and then uh, Mayoral Digital so, says hello. He's uh, he's he's uh, been in here a lot uh, lately. So uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, it's 
Good to see you Welcome. again. Um, now, a lot of your work, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm interpolating this information in my own head based interpolate away based on you know some of the interviews I've watched with you. It seems like a lot of your, like you don't seek out a lot of jobs. That a lot of jobs come to you. When it comes to voice well, acting, at this, at this point, at this point with voice acting, there's a bunch of people I've worked with a lot, and and, and they'll come back and bring me again. I, and I feel so blessed by that. I mean, that's, I mean, once again, not that's me not judging by my what I think. It's me judging by what happens. Right. You know, if I was to think, if I'm to think about a job, I'm gonna go, oh god, I'm never gonna work again. All of us are. All of us. There's all a whole bunch of us actors who will look and go, okay, this is the job where they're gonna discover I have no idea what I'm doing. So, so the fact that people come back is, yeah, because actors, a lot, most actors are insecure. You know, it's true. Well, I think, I think if you have any sort of, and this, I think this is anybody really. I mean, this is like a universal thing. If you have any yeah. sort of, if you're not a psychopath, <laughs> you tend to, you tend to judge yourself uh, a little more harshly than maybe others do. Yeah. And yeah, it's true. That's why it's really smart for actors not to be to know they're not always the best judges. Yeah, but it in either, in either direction because they can also be deluded. Right. There's also that delusion. Oh, I'm the best there's ever been. You know, and then and now. Well, it's not all the time. It's something that's just in stories in storytelling. It's one of the things that I don't know where I learned this. I don't know if this was like a Stephen King thing because I'm a big Stephen King fan, or if it's. Just something that I've from, learned over the from years. On writing that wonderful writing oh, book. Oh gosh, that you wrote. it was so good. Great book. It's a great book. It's so amazing. But it's like sometimes having a character do something, <clears throat> or or you know to try to inform your your idea of who a character is. Have another character talk about that character. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like here, yeah, your your work has sort of informed it in the same sort of sense. You know, because people keep asking you back, it's it's kind of a testament to how you work. You know what I mean? It's like, I hope so. I mean, and and I and I always think trying to be a nice guy who's easy to work with doesn't hurt either. Yeah, I hope. And that's you know, that's, that's what I hope I do. That's another universal thing that I've. I mean, Yoshi said it. Uh, there was a another VFX guy that I uh, had on the show, Miguel, um, said it. There's many people have said just basically. Don't be a douche. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like if you can be yeah. friendly and easy to work with and willing to learn, then yeah. people will remember that and they say, well, you know what? He may not be perfect for the part, but we can shape him into what we want. Well, you know, I, I direct theater. And when I direct, I will cast somebody who may not be the best one acting wise for the, for the role, but really wants to be there more. And, and if I like something about him, I figure, well, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a good enough director that I can get a performance if I need it. But, uh, but I'd rather work with that guy than work with this me, you know, who you can right. tell is going to be difficult. Right. And I think and, and acting is like dating. You know, you know uh, producers and people who hire you can read neediness. Uh, they can often read arrogance, uh, which is neediness. They can often read those things. Uh, although there's some people that learn those in the business who are douches but they make it and and you wonder why i often wonder why but a lot of people there's also a, a a category of people in this business that are just so driven to get it done mm -hmm. that that even if they're not the best talent it's that drive it's that ambition it's that they're just gonna do it and and they get it done and see and that's you know? that's also a universal thing i remember yoshi said to me, because I mean, I, I keep bringing up Yoshi because, you know, he was kind of like... Yoshi is how we met everybody. Yeah, That's yeah. Uh, but Yoshi is, uh, he basically said, you know, if you look at a lot of the big stars and the, the reason that they're big stars is because they're nice people and people want to work with them. And th that's, I mean, not yeah. only are they talented, but they, they also make it easy on the production. And then you, oh, yeah. Then you can you can kind of use a little bit of reason there and say, well, some of those people that have just kind of slipped away and they've, you know, maybe they're doing some direct to video stuff now and they're doing, you know what I mean? Maybe it's because they're hard to work with and they become a diva on set and people don't want to work with that. And it's like, if you start yeah, thinking about I, it, you're I, like, I personally, this is the most collaborative industry in the universe. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't get not, genuinely collaborating genuinely look let's just do this and let's have fun we get to be kids every day 
I had the honor of being a 10 year old every damn day. Uh, and, and please, why, why should we ever make this difficult? Yeah. You know, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And it's, well, especially being on the Game Chasers movie where I met Yoshi and all these, a lot of these people that have been on my show, that's one of the things that I learned. It's so collaborative and it's a beautiful chemistry. You know, it's like, it's like a big soup being made and everybody's uh-huh. got their pieces of the, the, their, you know, their ingredients to throw in. And without what that one ingredient, some things just fall apart. And it's, yeah, it's one of the things that I think is kind of beautiful about doing this show is that I get to shine the light on some of those people that are so integral to a production that they don't always get the spotlight, you know, because they're, you know, sound guys and VFX guys. And, you know, yeah. all of I, I worked for a small, uh, for a short time uh, as a, as a back job uh, doing interviews with below the line people. I used to, you know, script supervisors and, and just, and exactly. I was, I was doing those, I was doing written interviews uh, and, and it was fascinating and interesting. And I thought really valuable, you know, because when I go on a set, when I'm on, on an on-camera set, I got the easiest job of the bunch. I'm not the guy who comes in four hours earlier to set up all the stuff. Right. I'm not the guys that I'm not the grunts that have to do all the 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 the, the, the menial labor or the pulling the cords or the doing all of that stuff. Yeah. And, or the or the really good artists who are setting up camera shots and lighting them. I have the easy part. I get in my dressing room. I sit there. I wait. I go out and I act, and which I love to do. And, and and so I worship the crew, and and anybody who doesn't is an idiot, frankly, because these people are egocentric, you know, and you know, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, it's just it's it's just that's just dumb, because they can, frankly, if you're if you are egocentric, they can make you look bad, right, <laughs> right, yeah, and it's like it's it's just one of those things where I almost feel like it happens in like everywhere it happens in sports. It happens in all kinds of different, basically competitive yeah. kind of situations where once some, someone starts telling you that you're awesome, you start to believe it. Then you start to think that you're, you don't need to, you don't need to prepare yeah. because you're awesome. Everybody tells you you're awesome. You kind of have to have that little bit of, you know, knock down yeah, everybody now, do every now and then, you know? Yeah. But I, I mean, once again, this isn't competitive. It's collaborative. Right. And, and I think that we, we make that mistake when we say it's competitive. And yes, we're auditioning all the time. We're up against people. Right. There, there comes a point where you have, for instance, the whole business has changed for voiceovers in the last 10, 15 years. It used to be that you, that I would go and audition at a voiceover casting place up against maybe 30 people. Now I'm doing it online and I'm up against 3000 people. Wow. What's the point of being competitive? You're going to do it or you're not. You're going to get it or you're not going to get it. Wow. You know, uh, you're up against too much competition. You're up against name people and from, from most everything now. Names are big star names have, have squeaked every, into everything. Uh, so original animation is very tough to get because you look at the first 20 names on a, on a casting list. They're all names. Right. Uh, so, and then the people that used to be voiceover names take up the, the last sort of five or six, you know, the, 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 the used to be the big guns. Uh, and, hmm. and, and then it's, so it's tough. So, so the point of that is that there comes a point where if you want to do this, just keep doing it. And, and to worry about the competition, to worry about those other people is a, is a waste of energy. You know, every once in a while, there's a job that you go, Oh God, I want this one more than life itself. Uh, and that's okay too, but for the most part, send it in you and the other two thousand nine hundred ninety nine people, and uh, and in a in a perfect world, it'll start coming up. And once and work work does breed work, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, people do come back, or somebody gets wind of you on a job, and they go, oh, "Let's uh, that guy was interesting." I just uh, the person I was coaching just now was uh, was that was the case. She got uh, she got recommended to some, because of other work that she'd done to a major mm-hmm. director. And, uh, and they called her in and, and I don't know, out of the blue. See, that's, I I guess that's one of those things. It's like, and this kind of brings me back to the point that I kind of shifted off of, but, uh, or that I shifted. Well, no, it was, I think it was somebody in chat that I wanted to, I wanted to ask the question, but, uh, 
one of the guys that I've had on this show, his name is Leon. He's done special effects for some big, some big stuff. Game of Thrones, Justice League. I mean, he's done some big time special effects, but he said, uh-huh. he said one of the things that, that he did is he was just persistent, you know, and he just, he, but he, he was also kind of trying to learn as much as he could so that when that opportunity did come along, he was able to grab it. And I, I find I that people be assertive, but patient. Yeah. And it's, so it's, it's a little bit of luck. It's a little bit of, you know, but it's a lot of hard work to get yourself to the point that when it does come along, yeah. you can grab it. And that's, I, I, yeah, I always say that, uh, you know, I say I blundered in and I say I was lucky and, and, and all of that is true, but also there were things that I did do. Uh, when I was first starting out in New York, I would go, uh, uh, the nice part about, about working out in New York is that everything was kind of close together. So I would walk around, I would hike around New York and, and drop off 50, go to 50 offices a day and drop off pictures and resumes and, and things to try to get myself going. I took classes like crazy. I took, uh, not classes, classes, but I took workshops where I would meet industry people who could who would learn about my work. Uh, I took classes when I needed to take classes because there was something I needed to learn, like the commercial class when I first started. And then and then, I, and then, of course, I'd taken the acting classes in college and I would fill in blanks because I also think there's a professional student mode that happens where people take so many classes that they never get themselves out in the professional world and they, they have to figure out when to stop themselves. I think that's, and that doesn't mean they don't still study. That means they, they but they got to start doing it's, it. It's exactly. And I feel like in a lot of ways, like I'm probably one of those people that there was a lot of things that I never did uh, just because I was afraid to fail. And it was more interesting to, you know, to, to stay and learn about this. And it's like, oh, I got, I got really distracted by this. Oh, I need to get back to doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But then, you know yeah. what I mean? It's, yeah, it's a hard, it's hard. And it, and it is insecurity. And, and, and I think all the time, I, the fact that I get work always amazes me because this is such a crapshoot, high volume business. So when stuff comes to me, like, really? Oh, cool. But, uh, but I don't expect it. Right. I, I've always gone by the theory of the pleasant surprise. Audition for something and go, oh, I probably won't get it. And then if I get it, I go, oh, what a pleasant surprise. Right. That's, that's <laughs> gotten me through a lot. See, and that's, see, I mean, I think some people would look at that as like, oh, well, that's being pessimistic. You know, I'm, I'm probably not going to get it. No, it's being a realist. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think that's important, you know, to have your. To go, I'll never get another job. That's pessimistic. Right. Go, oh, I probably won't get it. I mean, I can tell you stories about, about jobs that I didn't think I had a chance in hell of getting for and and that i got for uh, for any number of reasons i once had a, a, a director tell me that i got cast because i was the only guy in the audition who didn't blink <laughs> it was an it was an optometrist look it was for coke it was an optometrist looking into one of those magnifying things into somebody's eye and i was the only one who looked in and did not blink he said that's why you got the job hmm. so sometimes you get a job because you remind somebody of their cousin that they like Sometimes you don't get a job because they remind you, you remind them of their cousin that they hate. Right. You know, it, it's to, to put too much on it is. There's so many variables. <laughs> you know, there's so many variables that are totally out of your control. Right. The only thing you can do is go into the best job you can, go out, go home. You know, now, now that doesn't mean that we're all capable of completely doing that. I'm not capable of complete, completely capable of doing that, but that's, that's the goal. Well, that, I mean, that's, I, it's it's to me it's one of those things where we can sit here all day long and we can talk about all these things and people go well i'm not a voice actor yeah but a lot of this is applicable to everyone you know what i mean it is it's it, very much so that's what and i love it, about anything it. you want to do whatever your passion is whatever your passion is there's a good chance that there's thousands of other people who have the same passion yeah so how do you so how do you go after it you go after it by by learning as much about it and getting as much skills as you can and then putting yourself out there uh, uh, in, in whatever way uh, uh, seems to be the most logical and, and a way to do it. You do it with networking. You do it with, uh, uh, if, you have, if you know somebody, you know somebody, you know somebody in the industry, ask them. You know, I, when I first came out to L.A., I, I would call, I called some casting directors that I'd known from New York, and I'd call their offices and say, look, I just want five minutes of your time to find out if I'm marketable here. I just don't know, and I trust your judgment. So I appealed to their ego and, and didn't try to ask for any specific thing. I just asked. First thing I got was an audition for L.A. Law. Uh, that was instead of getting a meeting, that's what I got. And, and just because I asked. That's actually really smart, the way you said that. Because yeah, it's, just, it's, it's it, and I feel like 
I feel like that may be one of those things. I mean, and that doesn't just work in Hollywood. That works anywhere, no. you know, because it's just a yeah. little bit of buttering up. So you can try to get, oh man, that's smart. That is really smart. I love that. I love it. I think that's awesome. Now I want to say there's a lot of questions in chat that are like let's, questions that I have. Crazy. So if it's, we want to go questions. Let's go, let's go to chat. Let's do yeah, it. Whatever you want. Um, like one of them is, I mean, exactly one of the questions that I have from Darth Octavius, who's a long time supporter Hello, of me. Darth Octavius, uh, long time supporter of Rob. Yeah. Uh, he said, uh, do you record at your home studio or both, especially during COVID? Yeah. All right. There, you, you know, I uh, I recorded one thing in a studio just at the tip of uh, of when closed when the cl things were closing the down in, in early March, yeah, before lockdown, just at the exact time of lockdown. I was afraid to go in. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm not young, I'm not skinny. I got you know this, so I I'm, I consider myself in a risk group, so I'm I'm afraid to go in. Uh, but I've recorded a bunch of jobs uh, from home. I, I've been recording from home. I've been doing my gigs from home. Luckily, I didn't think I'd be able to because I was, uh, 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 I think Patty and I talked about this in our interview a little bit, that I did not think that I was going to, I was, I always had good enough stuff to record auditions and I'd done a couple of little jobs because they could process the sound pretty well. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think because of the nature of my apartment and the nature of the loud neighborhood and the windows and stuff, and I don't have a private place to, to record that I would be able to do it. So I was afraid because I was seeing all these, all my, my colleagues with their fancy studios and I was going, I'm doomed. It's just not going to happen. Then I started to look around my house and I went, what can I do? And I'm, I'm sitting on my bed right now with, with, with Hokusai in back of me. And, uh, and I went, you know, and you notice there's a curtain rod and there's paper and there's big clips holding on the Hokusai. And, and those paper clips were something I bought when I was wandering around a Staples store one day going, oh, these are fun. Maybe I'll use these someday and bought them on a whim. And so who knew I would use them? And I started looking around my apartment. I go, okay, high bookshelf over there, high cabinet door over there, uh, big blanket somebody bought me, uh, uh, clip. Uh, hmm. So I basically created a Bedouin tent that, that uh, with, with the sound equipment that I had. And I, uh, uh, I put it, I put it up when I do gigs and I bring stuff in, you know, uh, recording equipment that I had that was not particularly expensive. I upgraded a couple of things uh, and I've been able to work and every job has been different. The setup's been different, the, the way it works. So yeah, I'm working from home and, and I'm going to, and since LA is not in a good way right now, even though they're trying to open up, I'm going to stay working from home. Well, we're in, I'm in Texas, so I'm in the same boat. And because, uh, yeah, you know, and because I'm immunosuppressed, <clears throat> Yeah. Oh, I haven't left. Stay there. Yeah, I haven't left the house for anything except for driving my car around since You're, March. Yeah, I go on scouting missions. I drive around and scout, and the scouting is always uh, uh, educational and makes me think I'm staying in a little longer. When I see the outdoor tables with no with no social distancing at all, when I see a line outside the Ross Dress for Less department store where people are this far away from each other without masks. And I go, eh, eh, eh. yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a hypochondriac in the best of times. So this is, and my, this is my, my whole lifestyle has changed. Cause I was a go out. All, I eat out. I eat out all the time. Uh, I, you know, I like to go shopping. I like to sit in coffee shops, read a book, meet friends. That was my life. And it's not now it's, it's I'm hiding. That's so I'm hiding with the waves. Yeah, you which had, could overwhelm me. Yeah, you moment. had mentioned that that you know you're you're somewhat of a collector of things and and you can't do that even you know because you don't you've no. not something that you buy online and all that kind of yeah. stuff. I mean, well, I'm a little addicted to Amazon now, which I wasn't, <laughs> but I've never liked buying online. I like going places right. and finding things. And, and so this is uh, on some level this is my hell, uh, but. <laughs> Because, because I'm not crazy about I, I, this apartment that I got to be. I'm not. I'm not turning the camera around. Is an apartment that I got as a crash pad. So when I was going back and forth to New York, and I never left it because the rent was cheap and it's in a great neighborhood. But is this someplace I want to spend 24 hours a day? Nah. So, uh, but I had to make my peace with it. Yeah. You know, you make peace with it. Yeah. This it's it's uh it has definitely been uh, rough, but it, at the same time, it's like. I don't know. For me, it's it's a little different because you know I was sick for so long that 
I was in the house for yeah. 17 months before. Oh, so, God, well, then you then then the fact that you have some kind of freedom is it must be a huge. Freedom. Heck, yeah. I mean, I can I can get up well, and walk around. It, can you can you talk about the nature of what of what happened? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I hope uh, I don't bore I anybody. I told you I'd turn this around. I told him before I was going to turn it around. No, it's OK. It's OK. Um, I guess it was 2014. Um, I had um, I, I was a I was a pretty big guy and I. I'll try to make this story short because I've told this story a few times on the show and, and I don't want to bore people, but, um, but for you, it's like, it's basically what happened was I, I started, I lost a lot of uh, weight really fast cause I was doing mixed martial arts. I got really addicted to it and lost 65 pounds in five months. And, but it turns out I have, I did that, yeah, I did that in a year once. So I, I understand. Yeah. So, but turns out I have, uh, diverticulitis and Crohn's disease, which I didn't uh, know I had. So what happened was is say no more, say no more. Yes, yeah, my I body cavity it. shrunk. My my intestines basically formed a kink, and we had issues. Yeah, went to the hospital. Uh, I mean, it was it was bad. I I I there's a lot of I shouldn't be here really because I mean I was I was really close, but um over the years I've slowly gotten better and better. Um, well, that's great. You look very healthy, and I understand the I shouldn't be here. I've got a couple of things that made me not uh, not necessarily the only medical thing was a burst appendix. Mm. Uh, but I got stabbed in the back once. I shouldn't have survived that. Wow. Oh yeah. Wow. And I'm not a mishmash. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was stabbed in the back by a woman outside a bar who was angry at somebody in the bar. Heard me laughing. Came up behind me, punched a knife to the hilt in my back. And, and stood her ground with a friend and said and started yelling at me and say get out of here and i'm like and i and it happened so fast i was on a, i was on a i was on a, a, a i was with a, I was some friends and and they it happened so fast they didn't see it happen and uh it was all very it was it was scary of course you go into shock when that happens yeah. so you go oh i've been stabbed in the back Perhaps this shall start to hurt soon. <laughs> it would be efficacious of me to get to a hospital. You know, and, it all, and they didn't see it, so I had to bring them all around the corner and lift my shirt and go, look, guys, me. And then, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I, and it turns out that it missed uh, kidney by that much. It missed lung by that much. It just glanced off bone and rib. But uh, when I sat in the car, when I sat down, and I, that's when the muscles started stretching. That's when I started blacking out, and I didn't know if I was going to live. So I was doing everything I could to stay awake, just like I punching myself and making jokes and being very, you know, just being very overtly happy under the, under the terrible circumstances. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that and the appendix too. I, I was, I should have that. I almost went on that too. Well, it's, that's one of the things it's like to me, partly this show, partly doing that movie, doing some of the things that I've done in the last year. It's really just, you know, it's almost like, well, time is short, um, and I saw I almost yeah. saw the end. So I need to get busy doing some of the things that I've always wanted to do. Yeah, every one of the, everything you do now becomes that much more important and sweeter. I mean, yeah, that's true too. I mean, that's it's like too. for me the 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 journey I went on it was perspective. It get, I gained perspective. I gained what was important, or I learned what was important and what wasn't. So yeah, uh, so yeah. Did this, this started after that? The show started after that? The the show started... The, what, the, what we're doing now, then? Yeah. Um, I started doing this show. I had the idea a, a long time ago um, while mm. I was still kind of in recovery, uh, but didn't really know how to, you know, what was the, what was going to, what was the catalyst to get me really getting back into it? And it was after I did the movie, um, which I was on set for, it was a three-week shoot. And then yeah. I was helping with the movie, you know, some post-production stuff and 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 then i just said you know what <laughs> what no time like the present let's get this going so um so yeah that's what the show is that's cool that's cool so i did we answer did we answer that guy's question i think <laughs> i think we did <laughs> but uh and we've got i mean we've got some others here i mean this was not on my list but um and i i okay so david revis is one of those guys he's 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 a really funny guy. He's a really supportive guy, but he he tends to be a little bit trolly. So I don't know if this is a trolly question or not. He said, "Did you meet Bill Murray on the set of Garfield?" No. <laughs> yeah, because I think he was just the voice, right? So he was just yeah, the voice. He wouldn't have been on set anyway. He wasn't, you know, in a animatronic Garfield, you know. And I and 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 my scene was I I, I was a second unit scene. 
Ah. My scene in Garfield was I was playing an engineer in second unit scene, and and it eventually got cut from the movie. They uh, they cut it. I don't know if they put it in on special uh, features or not, huh. but it got cut. Uh, I it worked hard. I did a lot of I did a ton of improv on it, uh, but uh, I think they eventually, they eventually cut it. Now that's I've been cut out, every big I've been cut out of a lot of big budget features, or at least cut down so you barely see me. Space Jam, Never Been Kissed, uh, 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 The Purge, Anarchy. All, all role where I did nice, good, solid roles, all of which I you don't see me, or you or or I'm or I'm in the background. And that's got to be, I mean, it's it's one of those things where, you know, <clears throat> I think anybody that's on set doing it, you know, whether they're acting, they're doing whatever, it's you're in there for the service of the movie. So I mean, I I, I get yeah. that you probably understand it, but it it still doesn't, you know, it's got to sting a little. Well, bit. yeah, that's always been that's always been my. Get the big budget. <laughs> yeah, it's <frustrating>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's I don't know I, it's I guess it's refreshing to hear that you kind of go you go eh, okay <laughs> I mean that's probably yeah, what you have to do that's kind of what you have to do you get go next yeah yeah you know, and, and it's not like I haven't gotten lucky enough in other places in other ways and then there's here, here's a big budget movie I'm still in I'm in the first 90 seconds of Joker my voice yes is, which is that state uh, and and that was a that was funny because I did that sitting on this sitting right here. And how and uh, how many voices of those are yours? Were you just the... uh, just just one? Hmm. Uh, they originally hired me for two, but then they cut one. Uh, but when the whole the whole that whole, whole audition process was fascinating to me because I got the audition. I was told we were supposed to voice match a bunch of these New Yorky sounding voices in the beginning, and I sent them all in. And, and this is this is me being lazy. And I got got a call back, a uh, note back saying, "No, guys, we wanted you all to to everybody audition. We wanted you all to not just do one voice for all of them. We wanted you to voice match them, and we're cutting the policeman." And I went, "I did that. I'm not going to send them another audition. I did that already." So I cut the policeman off and sent the same audition back, and booked it. <laughs> the one of the parts plus the policeman. Then they cut the policeman again, and then they said, "You know, we're just going to use the audition." So I never went into a studio to work on it. I just I used the audition that I did on my bed before I had the paper clips and the blanket. I wonder if that's, if that, because I mean, it's, it's kind of, they put it through like some sort of filter to make it sound like you're on the radio. So yeah, I wonder yeah. if they were like, well, you know what? We got what we need. I mean. Yeah. I'm sure that's what they did. I'm sure that's what they yeah, did. See, but the funny thing is I didn't send another one in. That's <laughs> that. Yeah, that is funny. And it's, but that's, I think that's, the cool thing, because I got to work, so I was a script supervisor on the movie, and then now I'm doing sound editing, and that's one of the cool things about Renaissance Man, everybody. Yeah, I, I mean, I, a little bit of everything, but it's it's more of a need of budget. You know, we have it's a very very low budget kind of film. Yeah. But one of the things that that I've learned here, I and mean, let me brighten myself up a little bit, that cloud cover Napoleon keeps going. Napoleon Dynamite was a low budget film. It's done just fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it hasn't come out yet, but we'll, you know, we'll see. But what I was going to say was that was one of the cool things about learning the sound editing thing is that, you know, the kind of stuff that we can do now is ridiculous. Like, I mean, oh God, we, you know, we recorded a lot of things, um, not to go off on this huge tangent, but we recorded a lot of things outside. We're here for tangents. Yeah. Rob. That's why we're right. here. <laughs> Answering questions and tangents. Yeah. It's fun. Uh, but yeah, there's like, there's scenes where like, there's a bird in the background and it's like, it takes away from the performance and I'm like, okay, so I go in there and I can delete the bird sound without affecting the, the harmonics of the voice. That stuff's astounding to me. Uh, it's, it's astounding to me. And this whole recording from home thing, cause most of the work I've been doing has been dubbing work from home of yeah. some sort. Uh, 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 Johnson was done from here. Uh, I mean, some of it was done from there, first done from there, but then done from here. And uh, and what they can do and how they can, you know, it's very funny because they're being very picky about stuff, about sound and stuff like that. But they're also, I'm also hearing that they can change it so much that you don't quite have to be as picky as you think you have to be. Here's one of the, the cool things that I've learned. Okay, so number one, well, I deleted a bird without affecting the rest of the audio, even the sound of the ambience. I literally just uh -huh. removed the bird. One of the other scenes wow. I did was, uh, it's not supposed to be raining in the scene, but it's just sprinkling. And you could hear the, the raindrops hitting the hood of the car. 
I removed the raindrops from the hood of the car. Wow. Without affecting the performance. You are, you are, you are now my new hero officially. It is amazing stuff. Now, here's one of the, okay, ready to creep you out a little bit? Creep me. This one was, I was learning about this one function of this software that I have. It can actually <laughs> change inflection of a performance. Okay. So, like, I never knew that was a thing. Like, like if somebody says something and you kind of want it to sound like a question, you can actually make their tone go up to make it sound like they're asking a question. Wow. And it's like the 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 exam. Now, I haven't tried this yet. It's not something that I've done anywhere in the movie yet. So, or whatever. Well, but it makes sense because they can change pitch and stuff. I mean, I've done jobs where they've lowered my pitch, and they and 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 I've heard things where they can change. Uh, are you ending up? Are you ending down? And stuff like that. But but to 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 go to that fine a point where they can make it sound exactly like a question. That's amazing. It's the, and the example that I heard, it was like I can't. I don't even think the actor would have been able to tell. Like they might go, "Hey, I don't really remember delivering it that way," but that's definitely my voice. So, and it's just one of those things that kind of gets you thinking Live about. Live action actors are in such trouble. Yeah, but it, but it's it's just more than that. It's like what can we do that's not maybe so good about some of this stuff? You know what I mean? And it's just like, I did, a, I, I listened to a little presentation the other day on AI and, and how the voices in AI are moving along and, and what the progress is going to be in turn. Are we going to get replaced? And the basic upshot, it was not yet, although in certain realms, possibly like industrial films, training films, things like that, right. where, where nuance of emotion is not necessarily vital. But then there was one company that they talked about, and I went to the company, uh, and I listened to their samples, and and the guy who was the basic narrator was an AI, was an AI voice, and I was going at the beginning of it, I was going, oh my god, that's so good. But then when the other voices would come in, they weren't quite as good. And then the more you listened, the more you heard the little things mm -hmm. in his voice. So I, so it may be that part of the problem is it's not yet sustainable over a long haul. Right. Well, just you, you remember the old days when it was like, Paul, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, that's kind of how it sounded. It just like, it doesn't sound natural at yeah. all. But now this it's... This one did not. This one sounded amazing. Yeah. Some of that text-to-speech is ridiculous. Oh, uh, yeah. it's, it's just a technology. I was watching uh, uh, Love, Death, and Robots just before mm. we were doing it because I, uh, I was for research for something. And I hadn't seen it yet. And I'm looking at that and looking at the sound and looking at the, at the visuals and I'm, and, and the mocap, and I'm going, oh my gosh. There's still that one, they're one level removed from being totally photorealistic, yeah. but it's so good. And see, I still haven't and, and watched that. That's on my list. I just haven't, I haven't watched oh, it. Okay. For what you do, watch it. Okay. There's 16 in episodes, so you're not going to, you know, it's not going to take a lot of your right. time. Oh, yeah. Well, then, yeah, I, I definitely have to. I'm addicted now. I just, the first day I watched it was today. I'm going to keep watching. Now, yeah, I keep looking for the thing, you know, part of how you, how do you survive the quarantine? You find stupid or fascinating TV. Right. I've watched all of Floor is Lava, <laughs> which is stupid. And, and, and but I'm going to watch these because they're little short episodes. So my attention span will be just right. Uh, they're really well done. The special effects, the, the visuals are spectacular. And yeah, so I'm in, I'm hooked. Oh yeah. It sounds, I mean, it's like I said, it was on my list before. I just never got around to. It's, you know, you know how th how it happens. You, you kind of go, oh, yeah, I want to watch that. And then, yeah. and then you know, something else comes out. I heard, I heard my problem in life is one of my basic models in life has always been if everybody else is doing it, there must be something wrong with it. So <laughs> when, life, when, when, Love, say, when Love, Death, and Robots came out, I was going, oh, everybody really loves that series. Okay, I'll watch it sometime. Who cares? It's, well, right. I it. it's as good. It's maybe better. Okay. Well, then, yeah. I thought, gosh, I'll have to put that on my, you know, or on my short list. Sorry, dude. No, it's okay. Sorry. Are, are we keeping ourselves from other people's questions? I no. You got all these people. Let's no. Well, there's actually a question that came in that I, I want to save until later because that's one of my questions. Um, so, so okay. Dad, just hold on. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Um, so, disrespect, son. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Uh, so, Baron Zeppeli, right? Yes. That was such i mean and talk about a bizarre story um and that's what i was kind of going to lead to is like how did that how did you form that character how did how did that come about that was i i mean basically what i'm doing is one of the guys that i've done a million times mm. but 
uh, with that one, his name is Zeppoli. He's Italian. And I talked to him. I said, don't you, don't you want Italian? You want to do Italian with him? Uh, and, and they didn't. They wanted the British, which mm. surprised the heck out of me. Uh, uh, so uh, even though they talk about him doing Italian and then his, his, his descendant later on does, they do him Italian. So I was, that could, I, and I hadn't seen that until recently. And I went, well, gee, why didn't they have me do him an Italian accent? I can do an Italian accent. But uh, but it was basically, I mean, you knew just by looking at him, and and it's the visual, it's the visual that snaps you into a voice right off the bat for me. Hmm. I looked at him, I looked at the hat, I looked at the stuff, I looked at the cape, I looked at well, he has fun, doesn't he? He just enjoys himself, uh, and, you know. And I didn't find out till later that part of that enjoying himself came from the pain of of his background. Uh, but but that just made it better. That just made it sweeter once I got there. Uh, mm. but, uh, so it wasn't much. It was just, there's the image. I got that voice in my quiver. They don't want Italian. He's having fun. We see him eating a sandwich on a wall. He, he try he punches through a frog, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so, so this is a guy that, 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 that teaches his lesson, but teaches it with a certain sardonic humor, which I find very easy to do. And see, that's, well, so did you like understand though, like what the story was about or you, you like you said, you were just kind of winning and just said, I'm playing this character. I was winging it. <laughs> we, we have the time. Sometimes if the, sometimes you do get context. Yeah. And also because, uh, uh, you know, I've watched so much television in my misspent youth <laughs> that there are rhythms and there are stories. There's only that so many stories. Right. And this is the story. Yeah. That's the mentor teaching the, teaching the hero, the stuff that he needs to be able to pursue his quest. Uh, and, you know, it's a very common story. <clears throat> and usually in movies, you know, you, you, Yoda, Yoda is an interesting and, and odd character that does the same thing. Uh, uh, Obi-Wan is too. Uh, they're two different shades of it, but they're, but they, they do that. Uh, uh, and, and since you, since there's only a, there's only a certain number of kinds of scenes in the world, there's seduction scenes, there's love scenes, there's power scenes. Uh, and that's kind of it. And it's just, we, and, and there's mentor scenes, you know, Zeno's a mentor. Uh, uh, um, Zeppeli's a mentor, but it's just a matter of what kind of mentor, I, you know, Zeno's a, an assassin. He's a little more serious, but he also knows that nobody can kick his ass. Uh, 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 Zeppeli, uh, he has had some. He's had some struggles, but he's he's come up with this thing that will that can give ultimate power, and is and he, and he needs to pass it on, and he knows he needs to pass it on. So he just uh, so so he's going to have fun doing it. Yeah, see, that's I think that's interesting too because I it was um I'm not sure if Octavius remembers this, but this was way back. I had a podcast back in 2007, 2005, 2007. King of podcasts. Yeah, it was way back. Um, but we we talked about how movies really are just, there's only like three movies. <laughs> and it's really yeah. just the way that you tell the story is how, you know, if it becomes a hit or not. It's all well, in the... If you even look at, if you even look at, uh, at, at screenplay writing books and, and history of theaters and everybody goes into Joseph Campbell and myths and... Uh, and, and and how and, and the, the the journey of the the hero's journey there's tons of stuff written about it tons of that and it's all pretty much the same and since movies tend to be very formulaic anyway because they think they have to be to make money uh uh yeah there's three stories i said i, I think we i'm i was trying to remember which ones they were and i think it was uh buddy movies mm -hmm. which romantics or romantic comedies or whatever they're technically buddy movies so buddy yeah. movies uh, the hero's journey and documentaries. And so like, <laughs> and stuff right. like porn, that's a documentary. Uh, <laughs> documentary. it's just like the, we, we, it was so much fun. Cause we were throwing all these movies out and I'm like, Oh yeah, it's a buddy movie. Oh yeah. That's the hero's journey. Oh, that's a buddy movie. You know what I mean? It's just yep. like, it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. I don't know. If... That's that thing I meant by an actor's quiver earlier too, where you, you just, you have a quiver of these are, these are the guys, these are the characters. Right. And whenever you get a script, you get sides for an audition. It's 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 that. It's oh, this is a love scene. Okay, yep. this is the power. Scene. Okay, <laughs> this is the. It's it's there's just a couple. And I think what we do, as I think as humans and as and as artists and as actors, uh, we overcomplicate. We tend to. It's all pretty simple. Right. And if we find we find the simplicity, we find the easy, we find the way of of of, of clicking into the simple. All of this gets a lot easier. It's almost like 
yeah, you've got to find that way in. And then once you find that, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. You know? Yeah. Oh, he's jealous of him? Yeah. Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah, That's exactly. really all it is. And then you, <laughs> and then when you see it in another script, you'll recognize it right away. Oh, that. Okay, cool. I know that. Yeah, what, you know? what story beat am I acting out today? <laughs> yep. That's interesting, though. I mean, it's, yep. it's weird, though, because it's, it really is oversimplifying something that, I mean, let's face it. I mean, acting is, it's not easy. Otherwise, I, all, everybody would do it. Yes, and yet it is. Because right. if you let it be, if you let it be, you know? And, and, and yeah, and there's actors out there going, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think let let me put it this way it may not be easy but the way people approach it with their insecurities and their fears about it make it that much harder so why not overcompensate on the side of easy to get to a place where you can do the harder work because you found the stuff that's easier that you don't have to worry about anymore hmm. you know it's it's I I mean uh, I I've, I've done enough coaching in my life and I've coached some amazing people that that once they got that once that little light switch went off I you know, Dave Batista right perfect example Dave's mm -hmm. doing real well Dave's one of the most soulful actors I've ever met and I, I and 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 he said in an interview he talked in interviews about about uh, Guardians because I coached him on the first audition for Guardians and uh, and. and he came in, you know, with all of that stuff going on. And I went, no, 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 this is easy. And this is you. And here's why and we can, you know, and just this, think about this, think about that, think about these connections to your life, go in there with an open mind. So if they change what you do, you know, you can roll with it. You'll be fine. And then he won. He's the rest is history. And I was actually, that was actually, I was going to get to voice coaching later, but it's per This is perfect because my fault. No. I ruined your flow. No, it's fine. It's fine. Because that's one of the beautiful things. And, and again, you know, I'm sure that there's a part of you that you're like, like all great mentors, they kind of say, yeah, this is how you do it. And you, you kind of co you, you, you coach, you kind of guide them down a path, but once they do it, then you're like, see what you did. That's what you did. Yeah. I'm telling yeah, you it was Dave. guardians it was always in Dave. Yeah. his work in guardians, uh, guardians one in particular was beautiful. Yeah. It is. And it was, it's, it's, it's not easy what he did. Like, at least from, from my eyes, it's not easy to pull off that. Cause I mean, it could really, it could really, he, he, I guess he was on that tightrope, you know what I mean? Where it could be ridiculous. And he'll say it was hard. If you see, if you see interviews with him, he'll say, Oh God, this is hard. I didn't think I could do it. You know, he, you know, he talks about, about how difficult he thought doing the funny stuff, especially. It's was. so and no, good. And it's, the humor he's, he's so is real. It's not like, it's not a force. That I think that's the the most impressive humor to me is the is the real humor yeah. where he's playing it straight. You know, and that's what's yep. so great about it. And oh, I mean, yeah. and of course, you know, the the whole you know, the it wouldn't go over my head. I would catch it. You know, I mean, just the way he delivers it, it's perfect. And then, of course, I agree. I agree. Um, I have to say, Blade Runner. Oh my God, his. I was. I mean, <sighs> I had nothing to do with Blade Runner. He, he was in the zone. But by holy he crap! Was, yeah, he did not. I agree with that. I, he's the soul of that movie. It's so beautiful. One ten minutes into the beginning of the movie, he's the soul of the movie. Did you see the short? Yes. Uh, it's just, and what's wonderful about that, the thing that impressed me most about that is the very first time you see him, the first shot is when he's in his garden and he's got mm -hmm. all that equipment on. And you, so you can't see him. All you can see is this big guy with a thing. And when he looks up at the ship coming in, his whole body shows you how he knows what's coming. It's some of the best physical acting I have ever seen. Just that moment. Uh, uh, you know, before he even gets into the scene. I And to me, that's everything. I think that movie's genius. Like, I'm, a, but I'm a huge Blade Runner fan. I have been for many, many years. I'm a big fan. Oh my god, that I loved, I loved that scene. But if, if he wasn't, if he wasn't in it, it would be a lesser film. I agree. And because because there's even that little callback to him later on in the movie where you just see him for a split second, and that has a lot of impact because of how it 
impacts everything that that Gosling's character has gone through. And before. I think the short was amazing too. And it's like it's a it's a it's like yeah. yeah. If you if you loved twenty forty nine, you have to watch the shorts because the shorts are so good. All of them are, but his is like yep. His is fabulous. Dave is the most soulful actor I've ever worked with. I love and and, and human being as well. Uh, I, I love Dave Batista. I wouldn't say nothing but fabulous things about him. I adore the man. And, and, and I'm so thrilled that his career has gone where I knew it was, I knew it could and would, uh, you know, it's nice to be right in your head sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it's, and if I had, any, if I had any little part of it, I'm grateful for that. Let's see. That's well, that's humility is always a, is always a, a good trait to have. Uh, but man, I, it's, I think. Yeah, I mean it's 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 kind of cool because we can kind of share his, uh, or you can, not me. <laughs> I said we like I was you. You can but, too, but you know you we can share in his success. You know what I mean? It's like it's like I'm I proud of him. I cried when he booked Guardians. I wept when he quit. You know he did too. <laughs> we both wept when he. You know, I wasn't with him, but I was doing it separately. But when I found out he got it, I cried. I said, "Oh, I was so proud." Yeah, so happy. It, yeah, I well the movie's <clears> cool, <throat> but. And yeah, I, I cried many times in that movie uh, in the theater, but it was weird because that was my first movie I saw after I got out of the hospital. Oh, wow. And so that's an important now movie. think about how that movie starts. It starts in the yeah. hospital. I'm sitting there bawling yeah. within five minutes. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. I mean, it was, but it was just a beautiful movie, though. It's such a good movie. Um, it is. So is amazing. funny and hopeful. Yeah, wow. And anyway, uh, we're not here to review yeah. Guardians. We, no, you and I can both do that for hours. <laughs> questions. Back to the questions. Uh, but no, I wanted to ask about one of the things that you had mentioned about like additional. It's almost like the additional voices. You know what I mean? They're they're not. They're almost not even credited in a way, but they're they're voice work that you do in many different things. Like, like for example, yeah. Cowboy Bebop, um, which was, I love that. I love that show. Um, and my good old buddy Bucho from New Zealand, he's the one that that said, "Dude, you've you haven't seen it. You've got to see it." I love that show. So how oh, how show. was it to work on that? I mean, was was it a big well, thing? Or? That that was that was very early in my in my anime career. I still was not somebody that people knew who they knew who I was. Uh, I, you know, I had done a couple of Walla sessions. I had done a couple of uh, uh, group recording sessions. Uh, I had done like little bit parts and, and then they called me in for that. And that was basically just over here. Yes. Oh, you know, it was basically a lot. Of oh, OK. Uh, so, uh, so I didn't do a lot in, in Cowboy Bebop. Uh, I mean, I did one episode of the series and I did the movie. Right. Uh, and it was mostly just that kind of stuff because I was I was literally an incidental at that point. Man number 27, guard number mm. 16, that kind of thing. But I did it. I see. You know, uh, here's a question kind of going back to Jojo. Right. There's a lot of yelling and grunting, and you're doing all of that. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's got to be... Do you, do you feel a little ridiculous sometimes doing that? Well, I mean, you feel like you're 10 years old, but that's the glory of it. Right. I get to be right. 10 years I get to you be get 10 to play. years old, so yeah. <gasps> I love doing that, so I'm playing. Okay. <laughs> I played Army when I was a kid. I, I, played, I, I did all this stuff when I was a kid. So I'm getting to do it. I'm getting to apply my, my, my infantilism. Right. Uh, that's, uh, that does sound like a lot of fun actually, but I was also like, I was trying to sit there and go, okay, do a bunch of grunts. I mean, is that, is that kind of <laughs> how they do it? Do you... Well, that's kind of how they do it. I have something I have to do, uh, audition for this weekend. And basically the you know, they give you, uh, you get hit, you get, you hit somebody three times, you get hit three times. So it's, <clears throat> and, oh, 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 you know, and, you're, and you're basically doing, that's what you do. Uh, and you just try to find ways of giving it weight. So it sounds real. <sighs> You know, and then there's the long death. The worst one, the one we hate the most is when we, we, we get burnt to death by flame. We get set on fire. Those are the worst deaths because they're the loudest and the, and the most painful. And, yeah. And they your voice if you're not careful. Yeah. But yeah, it's basically, that's basically what it is. And sometimes, the, you know, in video games, you, you, you save the efforts for the end of the, of the session so you don't mm. strain your voice. Uh, and, and often they, you know, like, like just like what I just did, they give you two, three in a row or give me five in a row or give me... If they're if they're being nasty one day, give me ten in a row. Yeah, you know, but uh, yeah, yeah, you could blow they out your voice really quick that way. I would think. Video games are very good for blowing out people's voices. Uh, the the last strike that we had one that was one of the big issues is how people would strain their voices too much and that people would bleed. 
uh, and, and there's you know there's professional studies about what your voice what your uh, uh, you know vocal cords can take so uh, it's 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 an issue it's something that people especially in games you have to be very aware mm. of. but in anime there's a lot of yelling in anime too because a lot of the characters are that overt right right it's almost like anime is like real life turned up 300 percent. so it's like yeah. you know what i mean it's like yep now there's, I mean, it's 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 turned a little bit that there's a, there, there's now some very filmic filmic realistic anime as well. Right. Uh, you know, Spirit, Spirited Away is a good example yeah. of that, uh, of an early an early example of that. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, one of the best ever. Yeah. And but a lot of the series, a lot of the series now, there's some of the stuff that I've done has been very realistic. Although it seems to be sort of switching back. Johnson definitely not film realistic. Now, that's one of the things that I I wanted to get to was Red Dead Redemption. And, uh, and McDougal, right? I mean, it's just how such a fun character. That was the best. <laughs> and you got to actually motion capture, right? This is. Yeah. I performance cash. I performance captured the whole thing. So yeah. was that, that was like, I wouldn't say one of the first ones, but it was definitely in its infancy, right? At that point, that was one of the, it was, uh, I mean, it was happening, but it was one of the, earlier complete performance capture ones I, I don't know how early it came but but um it was early enough uh yeah it was it was there was i believe some very landmark new technology used in in red dead uh because it's funny because we didn't get to talk about red dead a lot when it came out we didn't get to do conventions and all the stuff that red dead 2 has gotten to get but uh uh but uh yeah it was uh <clears throat> performance capture is the best because the perform performance capture is it's like rehearsing theater and I come from theater, uh, but you're rehearsing it with spandex and ping pong balls all over your body. So it's, it's silly and you're doing the fake props and you're going through everything and it's very physical and, it, and you're, and you, and you have to memorize. So you have to, it's not like voiceover where you sit there and read a script. You've got to, you've got to be in it. you got, you cannot be anything but in it. Uh, and that's, that kind of immersion is fabulous. Wonderful. So is that, I, I loved it. So it's so yeah. So you enjoyed it, but it's is that. Do you prefer that to to like a regular you know voice voiceover role or apples apples and oranges? Okay. I mean, I think I preferred that because it was so much like theater, and it was such an a an a, a, a totally immersive experience yeah. that it is one of my favorite jobs by far. Also, <clears throat> I kind of bucked the odds with that because, I you know you've seen McDougal. McDougal is a little skinny heroin addict. <laughs> I am not a little skinny heroin addict. And now I think the casting is much more to type more. I mean, you can see some of the shots. You can see my hand in the shots and you can see, well, that's a little pudgier than the heroin addict's hand. You can actually see it. If you're watching really right. closely, you can see it. But but they cast me uh, for my acting, obviously, because physically I was completely wrong for it. And I got cast anyway. So, and I know that, the, and it's funny now because they can adjust no matter what you, what you look mm. like, but they don't want to, right. they want to keep it close. I mean, they, I did do a government clerk in it that did look like me at the time. He looks just like me, but, uh, uh, but this, but that was to me, uh, kind of a miracle because I got to do some, something so incredibly fun. It's sort of, what a fun character. I remember like when you, cause Honestly, you you did you did talk a lot about that on Patty's show as well. But one of the things, and by the way, I'm I'm referencing a, an interview with Joe, uh, with uh, with very awesome Irish guy uh, named Patty Murphy. Yeah, and uh, just you can just search that on YouTube. He's it's a great interview. I had a great time watching it. But what it, I guess what clicked in my head was a job interview that I had where a guy gave me a calculator. And he said, this uh -huh. is a toaster. Now sell it to me. And I had no idea what uh -huh. to do. And that's really what you were uh -huh. doing. You're, it's real. Yeah. It's like, it's almost like acting one-on-one in a way because. It's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. And it's got to be, in a way, it's, it's, it's very freeing. But at the same time, it's like, do you ever, you're like, man, I wish I had something to actually interact with, but. It's well, the thing with, with mocap, with performance cap is they, they give you stuff, right? You have props. They may just be like a piece of wood being a gun, but you have something that you can latch mm. onto while you're doing it. I mean, I had a, a bedroom when I'm crawling around the bedroom, I had a suitcase, I had that stuff, but it was all basically pieces of wood. Uh, and, and, and since I come from theater, 
I've rehearsed with pieces of wood a lot. So, so it's natural. So it's it's kind of, it was kind of home, you know. The performance capture was home. See for me. that I, I think that would be really fun. But I, you also hear like when people, you know, st- specific actors and you know out there, you know, some of those, you know, guys, whatever, they'll say that they can't stand working on green screen because they have nothing to act against. And I'm like, but isn't that what you're taught at the very beginning? That's the fun. That to me is the fun of it is to imagine because, because whenever you're auditioning for something, you have to imagine the person you're talking to. You have to imagine where you are. You have to create that. And, and I always tell people that you will be more successful if you make your audience see everything around you. Than if you try to make them hear what you're doing, if you make them see that world hmm. by how you go about it, it's even it's more authentic. You know, if you know who you're talking to, and you know what you want, and you know how far away from them you are, and you know where you are, uh, and you can and you can communicate that with your voice and with your body, right. uh, it'll be way more successful. Because they go, oh, it's like, oh, I know where he is. Wow, that's. Imagine that's fabulous. That's amazing. Hmm. So it's almost like, wow. Okay. Well, it was one of the things too, that when I was learning about being a script supervisor, which I had no idea what, what it was when I started was you're literally having to, you know, before you get on set, you have to act out the whole movie yourself. And that was fun. Wow. So it's, it's one of those things where you're, you're trying to time things, right? You're trying to time scenes out. So you kind of have an idea, okay, this is going to be a two minute scene. This is going to be a five minute scene. This is whatever. In theory, I mean, that is the best way and to it's, do it. That's why when I write, when I write, I, I always act out the scenes to see how they flow, to see whether they're too long, to see whether the same thing. It's, I mean, I just, I don't know. It's, it's very interesting technique. It's reminding me of my, You're an actor my now. YouTube training <laughs> is what I was, because I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, yeah. Now, I wanted to ask about um, Kingdom Hearts. That uh, you get to play another favorite. You get to play uh, a pretty amazing character there. I, I, I had the honor. I, I did have the honor of playing Jiminy Cricket in Kingdom Hearts three, uh, and in the two point five uh, recut remix, the, the film they put together of cutscenes. Wow! And <laughs> what can I say? I mean, to be able to have an opportunity to, to I never in a million years thought that I would have an opportunity to do something like that, to, to, to be that I'm currently the guy who gets to voice Jiminy. I, I, I'm in the standing in the shoes of giants, you know, Eddie Carroll and then Cliff Edwards. I, I, I mean, I never thought in a million years, anything like that would happen to me to be able to be a part of something like that. You know, it's, uh, you can hear the emotion in my oh, voice yeah. just when I think about it. That's how I feel. But that's, you know, I mean, it's an I, a privilege. I was just I like amazed, you know, listening to clips. I honestly have never played the game. It's something I've always wanted to do. Never did. It's just one of those things. But uh, a very complicated story that Kingdom yeah, Hearts. Yeah. Story. And it's one of those where I feel like I need to play it from the beginning, which that's a lot of time to devote. Yeah. I'm that type that if I like find a mystery novel, I like, I got to go back to the first yep. one to find out. I'm like that. So then I end up not reading. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what happens to me. But I just listened to some of your performance and it's just like, it's just great. It's just, it's just oh, awesome. Thank you. You man. know, and it's, oh, thank you. It's man. somebody who, I don't know, like, uns- I have a tendency to, to be a bit hyperbolic, right? On the, Hyperbolic. you know, way. I, you know, Hyperball. These heroes, right? You, you guys are like heroes to, you know, to children, to, to people who love it, you know? And it's like to be able to be a, a, a part of that, just a little part of it. It's just, it's got to be so amazing. Yeah, I, that's how I feel. I mean, there are certain things I re- that I haven't had a chance to be a part of yet that I, re- that I would be. And, hmm. and I'm hoping I get the opportunity to at some point. Yeah, I want to be a, some a Star Trek something or other. I want to be in the Star Wars universe somewhere. I want to. I wanted. I've done a couple of Marvel, little Marvel things, but uh, yeah, I'd love to be a bigger part. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, besides helping Dave get into Guardians, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it, it, I would really love that stuff to happen. But 
yeah, this one, this, this one to me astounds me every time I think about it. And, 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 and I've listened to it and I went, I did that. You know, that's, it's great. That's it's how just I feel great. About it. That's how it's I feel so about great. it. I can't be anything but humble about it and, and, and in awe of the fact that I get to do yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's again, one of those situations where an opportunity came along and you were ready. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I worked hard. I remember working hard on that one because uh, harder than I usually do. Cause I went, I get to, to try this. Okay. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to, I'm going to buckle down, you know? And I did, and I, I didn't think I was going to get it because I didn't hear for a long time. Right. I got it. So go figure. Now, I mean, we, we've talked about kind of, you know, you're acting in, you know, some video game stuff and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, other than like Red Dead, where you're doing like performance capture, yeah. a lot of those kind of uh, tertiary almost voices, you know, those grunts or, uh, or whatever in the background, that's all kind of done the same way as, as sort of like some of this, of some of the anime stuff. Is that, would that be fair to say? Essentially, yeah. I, I mean, you go in, you don't know what you, you know, half the time you don't know what your character looks like, you don't know what you're playing, you don't, you know, you don't know the script because of NDAs and keeping mm -hmm. everything secret. So you go in and you and, and you're presented with something and you go, okay, how's this sound? Okay, good, let's go. And you go to and you go. And that's pretty much how it works. So, I guess during the pandemic, you know, with your recording at home, you know, whether it's a pillow fort or what, you know, whatever. My Bedouin yes. tent. Uh, does, do they read, do they just go, okay, here's the script, you know, send us back stuff or do they, do they get on like a zoom call with you and they kind of act it out and you record locally while you're mostly, I mean, every job has been different. Mm -hmm. I have not, have I done a video game yet? I haven't done a video game yet from here. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I don't think, well, I did something that was like a video game and that was just basically, uh, uh, you know, mostly they, there's certain um, uh, programs they have where they can take over your computer and they put you through Session Link and Source Connect and things mm -hmm. like that, where they're basically recording you. Uh, sometimes you will record a backup. Uh, and then I'll see uh, uh, for the dubbing stuff, I'll have the visuals on, a, on, a, on, on an iPad uh, with Zoom, and through Zoom mostly. But it could be through, uh, I've had it through Skype, I've had it through FaceTime, I've had it through various things. Every job's a little different. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they but they figure out a way to do it. And there's always glitches with the jobs because because you know there's 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 uh, what's the, the word the technological word for delay in the, uh, in these things. There's a there's a bit of a delay and the, there's a there's a word and I, it's not in my head at the moment. It'll come to me. But uh, uh, um, you know so there's some delays and if you're trying to sync stuff up exactly, yeah. the delays could be tricky and you gotta and and I think I've come up with a, a good way of, of approximating that and, and and so far nobody's had any complaints. But uh, yeah, every job is different. Every job's a little different. Uh, I look forward to. I would imagine in a game, they're either they're, they'll probably, if I do it, they'll probably, like I say, take over the computer, record remotely, and they'll either have me do a backup uh, on through my system that I can send them just in case there were glitches, because sometimes the sound frags sure. a little bit through through, through the, these things, even though I'm, I'm Etherneted up. So. Uh, to try to prevent yeah that. i mean but, i'm i am too and we've had many weird glitches on on this show where it'll just be like it'll just it's yeah. like like a plug you know it just got unplugged for a second and then it just comes back up and it's weird yeah. but this darn ipad i gotta tell you i've had almost no problems with this this is sitting here on the battery not hooked up to anything and there we are well it's it's been great i guess i guess my thing was like i was trying to think of especially trying to prepare this show and I'm talking about since the beginning was okay, I'm going to be streaming it, but do I record it locally or do I just wait for the show to go up and then, rec and then download the, so it was kind of like yeah. it, it, from trying to think, just think about logistically because you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who likes to think about all those things, like how, how they would do it on their end. I, I would think that they would still want that local copy just in case. Because I mean, uh -huh. even even through even through this, I mean, you sound great, but you're definitely okay. it's not the same quality as if I had a, a a microphone in front of your face. Right, right. And we I could have set it up that way because I got the equipment to do it. But I, 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 since I haven't had a lot of complaints on this, oh, it sounds great. Uh, yeah, it, it's I figured what the heck. Plus, it it gets more open. It's more. Hey, look, it's me. You know, <laughs> without a lot of stuff in the way. I, it's me in the wave, which could kill me <laughs> at any moment. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, give me just a second here. It looks like take as much time as you just take as much time as you want. Is everybody having a nice <laughs> time out there? I just wanted to make sure that the things were still okay on my end because I, I got a weird blip, but this for some reason this because yeah, we've been talking about technical stuff so you know when you start talking about technical stuff something's gonna go i completely. guess i guess um welcome welcome to the wonderful world of podcast <laughs> yeah now okay here's a question for you um because i think everything's good on on our end um yeah um you talked about you know you like you liked being on set you liked doing your tv roles your film roles and yeah. all that kind of stuff is there a difference in the way that, and this is really just a personal question for me, is there a difference in the way the set runs on a TV set versus a film set? That's a good question. I, I Well, I think the biggest difference is TV is about speed quite often. Right. You know, a uh, 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 film can be a much more relaxed because they have the time to make everything just so, and TV doesn't. They've got an eight-day schedule or a five-day schedule or whatever schedule it is. So that will make them, uh, that will make things go quicker. It will make things, uh, it will make them accept things that a film might not because it might, you know, I think that's the biggest difference. As from an acting standpoint, not really. Hmm. You know, you go in, you do what you do. I, I mean, other than the speed sometimes, that's about it. Yeah, I was, I guess for me, it was like <laughs> the movie set was, there was a lot of hurry up and wait um you know kind of attitude but i mean you have that on tv too but it's hurry up and wait but don't wait that long right okay okay <laughs> yeah, and it's just now 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 but then you're talking about sitcoms now then if you're doing a, a three camera a multi-cam sitcom that's a whole different animal that's theater mm, okay because if you get to do it before that and that once again that's another fun thing like performance capture where you're in front of a live audience and you've got to and, and you've got to uh, uh you rehearse all week long and you and you get changes on the fly i did when i did will and grace they handed me a big monologue the day that I tape it and said, you're going to be doing this too. Uh, and then I had to memorize it in the moment and they had to tape it. They eventually cut it, but, <laughs> but I had to do it. And, and, you're, and you're doing it in front of an audience. So you've got the laughter and you've got the response from the audience. And uh, so it's, it's, it's the, it's about five different worlds crammed into one. And that's very different from film. Yeah. But, but just one hour TV, the regular, you know, regular TV, it's just a speed thing. Hmm. Now with theater, you seem to, at least on your website, you you talk about it. That's your first love. You know what I mean. It's your first. That's your. Oh yeah, that's where I came from. That's that's where yeah. I came so from. can you? I guess it's like any anything in front of someone. You get that immediate feedback. You know, you get that immediate response. Yeah, it's immediate gratification. You know, you you know. I mean, with the TV show, you don't know until they broadcast it and there's reviews or somebody calls you and say, "I saw you on that. You were great." Uh, but in theater, you know, bam, you get your laughs, you get your dead silence in a dramatic moment. You get your, uh, you, you know, you can feel an audience, you can feel an audience. You can feel when an audience is with you, even if they're completely silent. Uh, and, and that's, and that's what the, the, those multi-cam sitcoms are like mm. too. So you're, 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 uh, it's the most immediate of all the mediums and, and thus the most fun. And plus you got to do it right, right then there ain't no retakes. Right. So if it doesn't go right, right then some of the most glorious moments in theater is when things go wrong and you have to figure out a way to finesse through it. Hmm. I mean, I was in, I've been in plays where somebody was backstage helping somebody else and they forgot to enter for their scene and, uh, and they just didn't show up. And we had to figure out how to sort of collapse around and make the play keep going until they got there. Uh, I remember when I was doing a, a play and, and that happened and we crammed their scene into the second act. We found a way to do it. We, we, they literally never showed. We got to the intermission and we said, well, we got to do the scene. So let's cram it over here. And we just made quick decisions and we crammed it in wow. and we got it all done. But, uh, but it, that's some of the most exciting of all is when you're thinking on your feet and you got to figure out a way to do it. That's that. And, and you got to make the audience not know or have the audience not notice that something went wrong. And, uh, wow. and I never even thought that that was, I mean, but it's almost like there's no play that you have ever seen where something hasn't gone ridiculously wrong at some point and they've had to cover. Hmm. Well, that's, that makes it even more impressive. And it's one of those things where like 
for I mean I've done you know a little bit of acting here and there I've done anything of any note with that beard and that hair I'm sure mm. they all want you nah no nah, it's this nose you know it's just too much of a you know cast too much of a shadow and just not not a thing <laughs> but I mean it's like I constantly am knocking things over you know what I mean it's just but anyway um <laughs> I do that with my whole body, so <laughs> but it's like that was always a lot of fun you know when I did do it because I did do a couple of plays, you know, in high school and middle, I think middle school. I started back then yeah. just because I was like, eh, let's try this. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And it was like the, like you said, that immediate gratification, you know, when you'd say something that you knew was funny, but can I make this funny? You know what I mean? For the audience and the audience laughs and you get that rush that end- I guess it's endorphins, I guess, whatever it is. Ah. Yeah. Well, sometimes, I mean, the Carol Burnett show is the best example of the other thing where they want it to go wrong and they want you to know it went wrong and they want to laugh because it went wrong. And they want to. And and there's that sort of fun of uh, of just look, look, we're screwing up. Yeah, it was. (laughs) And sometimes that becomes a communication thing with you in the audience where everybody's on everybody's side or they're on your side. Right. Well, that's what I was. And they go, we get it. We get it. Go for it. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking. The like for somebody not to enter and then you decide to do it later, you guys all had to have, be on the same wavelength and say, okay, we're just rolling with it. But you have to say it wordlessly and kind of like, but you know, this happened and whatever. I mean, gosh, I can't even imagine. You have to know, and you have to know when not to take face. You have to know when to sort of let, okay, that guy's picking up now. Okay. Okay. I'm going to pick up a little piece here. And I, and and that's how we did it in that play. I was, it was amazing. (sighs) Wow. That's, I don't know. That, I, I think that's super impressive. I I would have liked to have seen that and know what I'm seeing. You know what I mean? And go, wow, yeah. look at how good. That's, that's why theater, that's why theater's first love because of, of stuff like that. And theater is so applicable to everything we do now. Theater, the game, video games. If you're, if you're, you're doing a fantasy video game, theater chops really help, hmm. you know? Uh, uh, and theater also means improv and improv, you know, Improv theater and to have any kind of improv helps you in everything from commercials to games to anime to animation to you know, all the way down the line at some point it's going to fit in there somewhere so if being on stage is your favorite what's the most like what's the most challenging like what's the what's the hardest mode of acting i think i think i i mean i, I say theater is my favorite but it's kind of all my favorite now i mean because the voiceovers have saved my butt you know, over the last few years, and 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 I love doing that because, especially the lazy part of me, because I don't have to memorize. <laughs> uh, uh, and I think the most grueling is audiobooks, mm. especially if you're doing the 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 nonfictiony, the real, the dry ones. Right. Uh, I mean, I've done a couple of books that were 600 page books about economics and philosophy. Those are hard, and you remember, you also have to sit in the same position because you have to have this, you know, to have consistent mic positioning the whole right. time so you can't really move and 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 to, to me that's that's the most grueling hmm. i think i'm just like i i could almost have seen that answer as far as like the the grueling answer so what's the, so is the what's the easiest then like from that same well i i i, I guess I mean, to me, like I've said earlier, for some on some level, it's all kind of easy, right? Because uh, except for audiobooks, because it's just fun. Because I, I'm I'm having fun, but I think the easiest is when you do those jobs where you do a commercial or you come in to do an anime gig or you come in to do an audition uh, 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 of any kind of gig and you've only got a couple of lines. And you come in and you rattle them off. They say, "Okay, we're done," and and usually I go, "I am." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those, I mean, that's when it's glorious when you're getting paid the the, the union rate or the, or the standard rate, and you go in and you're out in ten minutes. Wow. Uh, those are the best. And that's that's happened. That's happened more than. A do few you times. do you ever think like, and and maybe this is something that you know with experience it's different, but like I would think if something like that happened, I'd be like, did I do something wrong? Or am I fired? Is sometimes okay. <laughs> sometimes. But there's a quote, there's, a, there's some quote that goes around that I've seen online a few times where if you plug somebody in for 10 minutes to do a gig, you're not just getting those 10 minutes, you're getting the five years that they right. trained to be able to come good enough to be able to do those 10 right. minutes. You know, you're, you're, and acting being that it's, I mean, acting rates are basically what acting rates are because jobs are so few and far between. 
uh, for the most for most actors. I mean, the the average for years, the average I don't know what it is now. It's probably the same. The average screen actor's got, uh, actor's salary was five thousand dollars a year. That's not a lot of money, you know. So jobs are few and far between. The whole residuals uh, uh, methodology and was fought for because, so that we would have a stream of money coming in. You know, if you work six jobs a year, if you're lucky, some people can work six jobs a year if they're lucky. Some mm -hmm. people work one. Some people go years without having gigs. Gigs that doesn't make them any less a professional. Doesn't make them any less a good actor. It's the nature of the beast. Yeah. You know, the whole thing of of three thousand people instead of thirty people. That means the, the odds of certain people getting work goes way the heck down. Uh, and and the other thing that's happened over that time is, as producers have discovered the internet, is they've also discovered they can get people for a lot cheaper. And we have to sort of stand up and say, no, no, this is, you know, pay us a wage that can help us make a living. Because if, if, if everybody got their way on the other side of the coin, we'd be making five bucks, a, you know, a job. And, and that's, and, and all we would have is, is hobbyists doing acting. Right. And, you know, there would be no professionals. And that's, except a million dollar movie I sets. think that's one of the, especially with like, I guess YouTube in general, any, any kind of content creation when it comes to the internet is that yeah. you get to a certain level and you become professional at it. You become good at it. Um, you know, like, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that I deserve, you know, a million dollars a year or anything, but you deserve a million dollars yes, a year. But this show takes a lot of prep and there's a lot of work that goes into doing it. And it's, but it's, you looked up all my stuff. You watched stuff. You're my well, hero. It's, it's it's my pleasure, actually. I mean, you know, to have somebody on that, you know, that that has the the career that you've had and continue to have, that's that's a joy to me because I get to help, you know, with. You know, there's always that part of me that goes. Like, <laughs> but it's it's. I don't think that'll ever go away. No, well, I mean, it's it's always nice to to be liked and to be, you know, to, to want, I don't know. It's, it's cool, but there's a, like my friends, right. The, the game chasers, right. They have that YouTube channel. They got their movie funded through Kickstarter and a lot of people online give them crap because they think, Oh, they just, you know, they're e begging is what they call it. And I'm like, Guys, yeah. we made a movie, a real movie with a real camera, real crew. It costs money. I, I think I, I think Kickstarter burnout just kind of kicked in because everybody, I mean, I got so many things on my Facebook asking me to give money to a Kickstarter for somebody's project. And, and I think we're in, a, we're in a bit of a Kickstarter burnout yeah. time. I think we have been for a bit. So, so I think some of it's just a knee-jerk reaction to that. But I think, but then, you know, if you do it right, if you do a Kickstarter campaign right, and you do it with passion and you get your money and you make a movie, yeah. I mean, this... But I know, but I, I understand the difficulty. Well, it's it's just the, the you know, making a movie on a budget is hard anyway. But then to get crap for it? Like, do you expect that yeah, this I'm, is just, like, we're just going out with a handy cam, you know, from 1996 and we're going to film a movie with it? No, we had to hire people, lighting and camera, you know, assistant directors and all of that stuff. Yeah. We needed that. And it's just, um, I don't know. It's just one of those things where in a way it, it, it kind of, it kind of sucks to hear that, that you're kind of going, not, not that you're getting hate for it, but that you're getting even more competition than you already had from people that are just willing to do it for nothing. When in reality, right. yeah, it's tricky. I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's, it's tricky. And I try not to get, yeah, I'm not bitter about yeah. it. And I, and, and I frankly think lots of times, I mean, you know, out in the world, there are people that don't know the nuts and bolts of what we do anyway. Right. Uh, and so they make assumptions. I mean, whenever we go on, on, on any kind of union strike, they're, you know, one of the things the other side uses is, look at these, uh, these pompous actors who make God knows how much money. And everybody goes, yeah, they make God knows how much money. He's making $150 an hour. And, and, and yeah, but that may be the one hour you work all year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's just a lack of understanding and you got to understand lack of understanding. Right. Too. Right. And it's like, uh, I don't, I, I don't want to get, I, don't, <laughs> I was about to get, get oh, harsh, oh, but it's a dark place. He's going, it's there. just, you know, it's, it's frustrating because we are doing it 
because we love this project. You know, we we're doing it because we love and you it. Wanna, and there's something you want to share with people that's worthwhile. Yeah, but then when you get yelled at, or they are, uh, honestly, I don't get but, that. But, you know, but another thing to always remember, the internet is about yelling at people <laughs> on some level. People who are nameless and faceless can yell without any uh, consequence. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, is, it allows them a place to, to, to be bitchy uh, without anybody calling them on it. And, and I think, and, and so no matter what you do, somebody's going to yell right. at you for it. And that's, you know, and, and that's one of the, th and then they're going to go. Yeah. Hide. And that's one of the things that we said is that we're not making this movie for the haters. We're going to make this movie for the people that want to watch it and are going to enjoy it. Yeah. Cause there are, I mean, yeah. I think it's going to be great, but Hey, I'm biased. So I'll watch it. All right. <laughs> I'm in. Uh, so, okay. Here's another part of the show where I get super, um, I'll just say I'm being selfish and I'm asking you some questions that I'm really curious about because I've, Yo, I, dude. Yo, are we going to have time for any more questions from all those? Um, well, honestly, it's kind of dried up and I've been asking some of those questions a lot. Well, the heck with you people come <laughs> back. But no, the, I have a friend of mine who is um, been a friend for many years, 20 something years or whatever. And he's been one of those people that's always wanted to do some voice acting, but never really because of circumstances in life and things. Yeah. He's just never done it. But I'm curious about from his perspective, like what would he do? What would, what would be his first step? Would it just be to record and, and get some demos out there? I think his first step should be take an acting class. Okay. I think because the thing that everybody forgets about voice, they think, oh, it's just using your voice. No, it, it, it's got to come from here. It's got to be, uh, uh, I think, the very first thing. And find a beginning actor class someplace. If, they, if they've done no acting at all, find a nice beginning actor, actor place, a community college somewhere, just to get your feet wet communicating with people. And because, act, because voice acting is talking to people that aren't there, mm. largely. So you need to get the muscle memory of what it's like to act with people who are there. Mm, I see. You know? what you mean. So I would say, I would say take an acting class, just take a nice acting class, maybe do some theater, maybe play around with that stuff while you're doing that. Yeah. Get some equipment, you know, get a nice little setup that doesn't cost you a lot of money because most stuff is done from home now. Uh, you know, there's ways of, of setting st things up for very, very cheap that will help you record and, and have stuff and start playing on the microphone. Start, uh, uh, if it's commercials, go to magazines, get magazine ads, start reading them. Uh, go by the two rules that I was talking about a long time ago, which is talk to one person you really care about that you want to tell a secret to and, and love the product as if you just used it five minutes ago. Not as if you heard about it and it's good or not as if somebody told you to communicate it, but as if you just discovered it or just used it. Those two things, uh, plus some acting, and, and you're, you're well on the way to the right direction. Uh, uh, the other thing to do is watch stuff. Oh, he's yeah. You know, people that tell, that tell me, oh, I never watch anything. Oh, really? Because if you <laughs> yeah. watch stuff, those rhythms will be in you. Some of those rhythms will already be in you, and it'll make it easier. But number one is an act is acting. Is getting your acting together because that's the thing that's gonna that's gonna hold sway. Cool. And that's, I guess. Uh, I guess my whole thing with him is that he's got. He practices his voices, you know, and he's like ridiculously good. And, but it's at the same time, it's like, okay, am I being biased because I'm his friend or is he really that good? And I want to help him get to that point where at least he can give it a shot because you never know, you know, and he's. What does that voice sound like when it's heartbroken? Right. You know? It's it, it, lots of people can do voices. Anybody you know, there's tons of people that can do great voices, or they can Im or they can mimic other people's voices, and uh, that's great. But if you can't act it, remember, I mean, you know, everybody, you, know, you, you always hear, well, you got to audition with a unique voice. I can't tell you how many times I booked a voice because I could do this, which everybody can do. You know, you can do that bull winkle moose kind of thing. I can do it like everybody else can i booked a lot of jobs using that voice because in the moment whatever the acting need was i could fulfill it right you know rather than just well i can do a funny voice but i can also do a heartbroken funny voice you know it's it, it's it's being able to do the, the acting is always it's always first about the acting 
and second or third about the fourth. Right. Sometimes third, sometimes fourth. Well, it's kind of funny. If you think about it, in a lot of ways, I think real musicians, they start off by mimicking first. They're doing their covers and they're learning. But then over time, the more they learn, the more they start to learn technique and then they can apply that to writing their own song. And maybe that's what it is, is yeah. it's, it's finding your voice through trying a bunch of different things. I'll tell you that guy, I'm t- like his, he is the one that kind of taught me how to do a Scottish accent. Do it. Let's go. Scottish accent. Yeah. So like, um, for an example, I'll read this, uh, Inside the voice actor studio with Tony Oliver, Dee Bradley Baker, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, and L- Laura Stoll. What advice would you give to people wanting to get into vi- voice acting? Right? Yeah. So, it's good. thanks. And he, but he's better. He's like, better than that. And he's, uh, it's, he said, it's all about the vowels. He said, because he's, what he's done is he's, he basically talks to himself in these voices all the time. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And he's different. He's got a Scottish. He's got an Irish and a Russian and a, you know, the Scottish. That's great that he can do all that. Kenny right. Act. Right. And that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to tell him. I'm going to say like, cause I don't honestly know. I think he did some theater arts and stuff. So he's got to have some of that stuff because he can, I don't know. We'll see. We'll, but I'll give him some of those tips because that's, I think that's. That was not selfish, Rob. That was you trying to help a friend. Well, right. Well, <laughs> that was not selfish. That was not a selfish question. If you're going to ask me a selfish question, ask me a dang selfish question. Okay, no. Uh, <laughs> now, that, here's another thing that maybe you can talk about this, maybe you can't. But I wouldn't think it would be that big, big of a deal. So you have an, like an agent just for voice acting? Is that how that works? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have a separate one for, for film? Well, on camera, yeah. Separate. Wow, okay. And a separate one, and a separate one for commercials. Wow. Okay. I'd say that's something I I was kind of curious about. Um, I mean, there, there's some people that, that do across the board for everything. There's some agencies that do that. In New York, it used to be that you, uh, and I don't know if it still is, but I'm assuming it still is. When I was in New York, I was freelancing with agents for commercials, and there was at one point where I was freelancing with 22 agents. Right. I had 22 agents that were sending me out, and then I got a bunch of national commercials in a row, and I decided I wanted to have one agent so I could hopefully get more be more primary in their minds mm. so i wrote to all 22 agents to say hey look 60 you know, a bunch of national commercials in a few months anybody want to sign and and none of them said yes and then another agency that i just happened to have met uh, at some workshop they did and i was with buckwald for quite a few years mm. uh and loved being with them i see that's really uh, wow 22 so out there you can freelance here you have to sign but you can sign with different agencies for different specialties hmm and so, I mean, I assume it's just like a, kind of like a sports agent. They get you the job, then they take a portion of blah, blah, blah. And you, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So the, now that nowadays with voiceovers though, people also have uh, uh, multiple agents in multiple geographical locations. They'll have a, a Portland agent. They'll have a San Francisco agent. They'll have a Chicago agent. They'll have an Atlanta agent. Oh, okay. And, and that's, that's true on camera too, actually. Cause the uh, jurisdictional, uh, the, I think the LA's, jurisdictionally challenged to some degree and all of the other ones are too that's but i don't have those i just have the, the la agent right now hmm. and i'd still have buckwald i'm sure if i went back to new york they'd, they'd, they'd hide they'd let me they'd let me play hmm. I, I just i think that's it's really smart you know what i mean it's almost like like diversification you know what i mean it's like don't put all your eggs in one basket or shoe or yep. whatever that's been the lesson of why my career has been able to go along because once again, I diversified into sound into voice from on camera. If accidentally I still did it and, uh, and it's saved me the last few years because it's been the primary yeah. thing. I wouldn't have guessed it. That's one of the things I was going to just say too. uh, for those of you who may be interested in voice acting, um, along with Joe's great advice on a lot of this stuff, that's one of the things I wanted to mention if he didn't was that there's a, there was a free, uh, on Comic-Con, Comic-Con at home, right? That's this week, this weekend. Uh, yeah. they did yeah. inside the voice actor studio and. No, that's just, you're quoting that I was told. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. That's what I was reading. And it was, it was really kind of like eye opening because a lot of them say, you know, 
when you get started doing something, the tendency is that you got to get the best stuff. He said, you really don't need the best stuff. It's really about you and what you can provide, right? Because technical, I guess yeah. technical, uh, I don't know, those technical problems or issues aren't as big of a deal as if whether you can act or not, like you said. I've done a whole bunch of jobs from my house with a $100 microphone. Yeah. Wow. Everybody says it's fun. Well, there you go. You know, it's a matter of how you treat treat the area so that you, you keep outside sounds from coming in. And it's got to be a good enough $100 microphone that the quality is good, but it's a $100 microphone. And see, that's I think that's really important, you know, especially, gosh, even doing this show is not like super technically you know, like I have a bunch of expensive stuff here. I mean, this is, I think that's important because if you want to do it, just do it, yeah. you know, just try it. Yeah. I, I what well, this, I mean, I really learned that here because like I said, I didn't think I was going to be able to do work from here. And, and yeah, I spent a little money to get a better interface uh, and I spent some money on a couple of things, but by and large, I'm using the same microphone I've been using for auditions for years and blankets and paper clips and stuff on the back wall and that's new i had the towel there from patty's interview <laughs> the the forbidden planet right. towel <clears throat> and uh and yeah so it, it's i have learned so much in the past few years that if you want to try it try it and don't think of any of your limitations as limitations i was just uh, i just did a I judged, I, I, I was supposed to be a judge on a pageant this year, which is the first for me, uh, uh, the, the Ms. Wheelchair USA pageant. And we couldn't do it because of coronavirus, but what we taught, uh, me and another one of the judges taught a voiceover class to them, hmm. we, to, to the contestants. And all of these women uh, uh, are somehow physically debilitated from, from, from ALS to, to, to all kinds of, this one girl had this, terrible thing that affects her voice but she has this beautiful rich husky voice so i said it's not going to affect your voice you can do this and and it was so inspiring to see these women who all who are doing a pageant when they have this these huge uh, uh physical um things in the way but they're doing it you know uh uh i mean i've told this i, I have a story that i tell about something that happened to me a couple of years ago uh, that I that I've told on so many stories, shows I shouldn't say it again, but it basically involves me uh, getting a job I never would have expected to get while I had a, phys a big physical problem, and 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 still getting it. I found that really inspiring, and, by the way. That you're oh, that's right. You you yeah. heard the, you you heard I, your story. But it's I mean it's uh, fantastic. It's it really is. Um, I mean I think I think in a lot of ways you know a lot of people have those stories. Um, and some yeah. of the stories, it's just like, again, part of the reason why I do this show is that sometimes there are stories that happen when the cameras are off and some of those stories are better than the movie turns out to be, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just, but it also comes, it also comes under that umbrella of, we are never the best judges. Yeah. If we are left to our own devices, we will use our insecurities to stop us from doing stuff. Yeah. From doing absolutely. Anything. And if we and if we just just don't listen to ourselves, <laughs> uh, just go and try it anyway, and then see what somebody else says. Is it you know they might they might say oh you need some work oh your voices are great but you got to learn to act. Uh, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean you give up. That means you learn to act. You know it means it means that uh, that oh yeah, the voice it's a little tinny in there. I think one blanket with a paper clip will fix it. Then you do right. it. Right. You know it, it's it's not that it's. We, I, I don't think we should ever be denied the opportunity to pursue our dreams. And one of the chief deniers of that is us. Right. Yep. Being afraid you of know? failure. That's, that's my biggest. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid of failure. I've been afraid of failure all my life. So I get into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is 90 for you. Always, you know, 70% of actors job is going out and trying to find a job. 10% of it is working. The other 20% is just, sitting going please lord let me get something just get in your, your you know? i mean i i would assume that especially for like you said for you being such a, a person that likes to be out and to be inside and with the lack of or the the i guess scarcity of jobs 
that's got to be tough right now. Where, like to, to, just to get in your own head, you know what I mean? Or get out of your own head. Well, well, that's well, luckily I've been able to work from home doing voice stuff. So I, I mean, the voiceover community is working all the time because yeah. we can all work from home. So we're doing pretty well. I mean, I'm not, I can't say I'm making a million dollars, but I'm working. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and lucky, lucky me, yeah. you know, that that's happened. Uh, and, and every time I think, oh, God, I'm not going to be able to do this kind of job, like I was worried that, uh, that you know, one of my favorite things to do that's a lot of fun is, is speaking of post-production, is film moving, is being in ADR groups. I did an ADR session a couple of weeks ago from my house. It was a group session. There were 10 of us in the group. Uh, and we did it. And we did it on Zoom. And, and who would have thunk that? The, the, the technology keeps playing with us. Another thing that, you know, it's... it's so I, I, yeah, I'm just amazed. I'm getting to do that stuff. Oh, oh. I just like we fell no, asleep. No, 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 no. Sorry, my, <laughs> my, my dad texted me something. Okay, so hey, we we haven't. Did we answer your dad's question? No, but that's one of the. That's what I wanted to. I wanted to wrap with. But one of the. Um, this is one of those things that um, Miguel actually he works for Nvidia. You know, he's he mm-hmm. he does some. He's a supervisor of character design, I believe, or something. I can't remember exactly. I guess I could pull it up through the event. But anyway, one of the things that he had mentioned was that there's a there's a function or, that, or there's a new app out from NVIDIA that if you have a certain video card in your computer, you can download this software. And what it does is it isolates your voice so that no matter what oh, yeah. background noise you have, um, it will... Me, why? Huh? Yeah, what it's want? it's called. Um, in fact, let me just really quick. I want to look it up because I think it would. It might just be something that you might want to look into. Uh, audio, sure, thanks. RTX audio. It's audio. what it is. Is I can't remember the name of it. Um, because it's an it email. Yeah, later. but yeah. what it is is basically is it runs off of the graphics card, which is weird, hmm. but it's a. Cause it's something that for some reason I don't have on mine because I was going to install it immediately. But, uh, it's basically what it does is it, it takes out all the background noise and it just isolates your voice perfectly. And he was using it on this show and he said there was all kinds of stuff going on that he could hear, but I couldn't hear it through the, so it just may be something. Hey, just, I'll send it to you. Yeah, interesting. Thanks. But also, Thanks, yeah, of man. course. Well, that, that comes from my dad. I would have even thought to ask you or to tell you about it. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> but also, the question that he had was, what, what's what been your favorite thing to do? Like, what's your your favorite project? That's so, I mean, that's so the hardest, you know, that's so I the know. hardest question. Because, uh, uh, well, yeah, and we talked about a lot about the honor of doing anything, Jiminy. Uh, to, to be able to current, you know, currently play in that pool yeah. is, is right up in top five. And it's hard because I've, I've done so much. Deal. We've covered a bunch of them. That, McDougal, uh, uh, getting to be on Seinfeld. Uh, I didn't do much, but I, but I was there and it was a fun, it was a hugely fun experience. Yeah, see, I didn't get to watch that episode, but I, I did see the, the images and I'm like, I'm like, oh man, that must have been amazing. Like, are you, were you a big, uh, like a fan of comedians or was it just I was a fan of Seinfeld. Okay. Oh, I got to work with Don Rickles once. That was that was Oh man. That. There was a show called uh, it was Daddy Dearest, I think it was a show. It was Richard Lewis and, and, and Don Rickles. Uh Don Rickles was Richard Lewis's father. And that was that that was a wonderful show. I don't know if I've told this story a lot. But uh he um <clears throat> and I love Don Rickles. A huge Don Rickles fan. You know, that's part of the whole thing. I mean, I've gotten to work with Dick Van Dyke and Andy Griffith and all these, like, oh, my God. You know, that's that's my favorite of getting to do that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> I was doing a sitcom, and I was the school principal at Richard Lewis's son's school who fancied himself a stand-up comic. And they were doing a talent show. And before the talent show, while the kids were going to the bathroom, the principal would come on stage and do his stand-up routine to try to fill space. Now, all of this was basically background for a scene that was happening with Richard Lewis and Don Rickles. So I really, you know, I, you heard 10 seconds of it when they finally did it, but they gave me a four page stand-up routine to record, to do, to memorize. Wow. 
they gave it to me uh, uh, the night before I had to do it. I went in the next day and we recorded it. Uh, uh, Don Rickles came up to me and said, wow, that was really, really good. Uh, and then he, for the rest of the week, would come up to me and say, am I doing okay? Uh, yeah, how am I doing? Am I doing all right? He was, he was genuinely insecure and he would ask me, are you asking me? You know? Uh, and so, so to me, that was kind of a dream. Yeah, that had to have been a uh, thrill, it, it, you know? Oh, utter, utter thrill. And the funny thing is, a week later, they had me come in and do another three pages worth of monologue. And you never heard any of it in the episode for like 10 seconds. But they had me do all the, and that I had to memorize wow. on set. So, which was kind See, of funny. See, and that's, uh... but I think, yeah, that's, that's one of my favorites. And it was a show that it didn't really last long, but who cares? Yeah, and it's, what else did I? It's so tough too, because I mean, I can just imagine, you know, like, let's say, you know, hmm, I get to work on all of these movies down, down the road. There's going to be moments on every single one of them that are awesome. And that are like, how do you, it's like, how do you pick between your children? Yeah. You know, that's right. Just, you ask that question. You ask that question. And I'm sitting there going, oh, Don Rickles thing. <laughs> I did it. I, I could go on, you know, for weeks. There was a, I did a thing on, on Naruto, the character on Naruto. That was one of the most beautiful jobs I've ever had. Uh, it was a six, a six episode arc that Mary Elizabeth McGuinn directed. Uh, since you mentioned mm -hmm. her name earlier and, uh, and, and we were crying at the end of it because it was such a beautiful role and it was very filmic. It was very filmic for anime. And, and it was, uh, it's the character's name is Doku and the arc is called power. It's Naruto Shippuden power. And I basically play a shalabi guy who saves a bunch of kids in his village and gets reunited with the, with the love of his life who he, who he almost killed when he was younger accidentally and felt guilty about. And, and he saves the world and he helps Naruto find his power back. And he's still just this shalabi guy like me and uh so it was very very rewarding and and i loved doing that one that was one of my favorites yeah but you know wait five minutes i'll think of right. another one sorry dad uh, no it's i mean it's it's one of those where you know like there's been a lot of times when i've when i've had somebody on and they go hey what was the worst thing that, that someone did to you on set and i'm like okay you can't you can't tell that story number one i mean you could but you know you may be looking for work a little bit what just had a yeah, what yeah that but it's with? like there's all there's also <clears throat> like to me the favorite question has got to be you know a tough one because there was like i can tell you there were and i've i've told a lot of the stories on on this show some of the some of the best days there were multiple moments that were just like amazing stuff and you yeah. can't oh, yeah. you know but at the same time you do your best and you try to tell some of those stories well, just, I mean, every time you're on a studio, when every time I'm on a studio lot, uh, I, it's my it's my favorite. <laughs> just because I'm, I'm on the Paramount lot. I'm on the Warner Brothers lot. Oh, my gosh. I'm in history. I'm here. Right. You know, that's uh, that in and of itself is, is plenty. That's one of the things that I, you know, well, let's let's get rid of this pandemic first. But that's one of those things I want to do yeah, is yeah. I want to I want to get out to L.A. and and uh, at least do some sightseeing as just a dude. You know, and then come out. Yeah, out. and then maybe I can, you know, drum up some work or something. <laughs> maybe. Well, I, I, you know, come in with come in with a, with your film and and maybe a couple of others after that. And I mean, now it is international. It's right. all international now. It's all wherever you are. You know, before the pandemic, it was that. Right. You come in with stuff. Actually, an interesting thing I was thinking about about the pandemic. I, I think I mentioned this to somebody the other day. Is that actually I did it on an interview. Uh, about how much I used to complain about how the more we created t uh, uh, technology to supposedly bring us together, the more we're torn apart because we're not actually having real conversations and real interconnection with human beings in person. Now that we're in the middle of this, it seems to have switched. Yeah, we're. That now some of the most wonderful connections that are happening are people checking in on you, or, or a thing yeah. like this, or a Zoom meeting with a bunch of friends, or. Uh, 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 just uh, somebody checking in on, on face on Facebook camera time to see if you're doing okay. Yep. You know, it's 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 nice to see that little flip. Well, it's, know? it's just like it, the internet, right? There's the good and the bad. I mean, it's like you know, or yeah, people. But the good is, I think, the the good is it, that good is as has amplified. Yep. I think a hundredfold. Yep. It's just you know, my whole thing is it's kind of hard to convince somebody of, of something in 280 characters or to make a point, you know, yeah. even, but I'm just talking about connection. I'm talking about calling. Oh, sure. A friend. No, I, I, I totally, I totally read you. I'm just like, that's one of the things that's, it's like, 
why are you people arguing? <laughs> we, there's so many things to be happy yeah, about. I mean, yes, we have there's issues. That. We have problems that we're dealing with them. There's, you know, things are on fire. Yes, I know. But there are also, we have to not forget that there's good things too, you know? And there's, like you said, just as simple as calling up a friend and going, hey man, how you doing? That's, uh... I, the people that have contacted me during this, either through Facebook or through somewhere else, you know, through, through or through a, just a, it have been so gratifying. People I haven't heard from in years. Yeah. You know, just checking in. Uh, that's been really rewarding. I've loved that. You know? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's amazing. Uh, and I guess for with that, I mean, I think that's a good note to end on, actually. I mean, you know, I it's a little, a little, some positivity, you know? <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like a little positivity. But, Joe, I just want to say, again, thank you. Thank you for, for being on my humble little show here and, and sharing with us your... Thank you for inviting me on your on your humble little uh, show, for this humble little actor. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me on. It was, it's been an honor. It's been a wonderful conversation. Okay, great. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy you enjoyed it. I, I, I do my best. Uh you're, you're doing a great, dude. You're doing a okay, great job. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that. You need, you, you need to oh. know that. Yeah. Once again, we are never the best judges of how we're right. doing. You're doing a right. great job. All right. Dude. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And guys, thank you again for watching, hanging out uh, with your questions, with your, you know, with your time. Yeah. Thanks. Everybody. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Yeah.